today's guest, um, Jeepers. Uh, I, you know, I've never had an interview where it was not a conversation, really. So I think it's, you know, and I'm saying this now because I, I, it was hard to get a word in. Um, I am grateful for this man's time, but I was happy when it ended. Uh, this man is a former governor of Minnesota. Um, he is a unique man, and he will tell you all about it. Uh, I am very grateful for his time, and I mean that. And I learned a lot that I can do a better job as an interviewer, I think, for sure. I did learn that. Um, but he makes some really interesting points, and he does talk about some things that I'm really excited to uh, – that, that I was grateful to get to speak – for to hear him speak on. Um, I'm not trying to rinse the dude, uh, but I didn't get a chance to say anything. So I felt like at the very least I deserved that. Uh, I'm very happy to have today's guest – Mr. Jesse Ventura. For me to set that talking break and let myself all wild shine that light on me. I'll sit and tell you. You ever see these ads on TV now where where uh, they got the big lawsuit against 3M because the hearing devices for the military and combat apparently were defective? I haven't seen them. Well, they got ads on TV all the time. And these, right. It's a class action lawsuit. Right, you see those, I see those you, lawsuits Yeah, a lot. that if you're deaf and you served in the military, blah, 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 and you had 3M made these things you stick in your ears, I guess, that are supposed to save your hearing. And what happened? Well, no, and they didn't work function right. So now there's a lawsuit on it, which is all fine and dandy. But I sit back and go, well, gee, what about us Vietnam guys that nobody gave us nothing for our ears? Yeah. We're all deaf today. <laughs> and, 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 in our, and, in my, and, and what it tells me is this, how different the combat was in the Middle East than Vietnam. Because in Vietnam, you couldn't wear earplugs. You relied on your ears. Wow. You're in the jungle. You got to listen. You got to hear. You you hear a twig snap. It could be your life. Yes. Yeah. And you have to hear it. Right. You know. But in this urban fighting, apparently you can put in earplugs and blast each other because you're in the city. Right. <laughs> Which, For mo or the desert. So it's just interesting how, like, through bat uh, as time. But I mean, where's our compensation? Right. I'm deaf as right. shit. Right. Yeah. I can't. Because I sat and shot stoner machine guns and all this shit yeah. and blew things up. Yeah, you can't even listen to Pearl Jam enjoyably, you know. Where, yeah, what? Oh, no, but there's better than Pearl Jam yeah. now. <laughs> I found a new young rock band that has given me my youth again. What is that? It's a group, I don't know if you guys know them, Greta Van Fleet. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. I, I, I was a huge Led Zeppelin fan. Mm -hmm. And Bonham died. And the rift between Plant and Page, they're never going to get together. They're never going to play again. And I, my heart ached because I thought I'm going to go to my grave and never hear any more Led Zeppelin. Yeah. They're gone. Yeah. My son comes over the other day. He says, hey, Dad. He said, you like Zepp, didn't you? I said, hell yeah. I saw him in 72 and 75. And he said, listen to this. And he put on a song. And I sat listening to it, and I looked at him. I said, what, did Jimmy Page release shit from the archives? I've never heard this Zeppelin song before. Wow, that much. He huh? goes, They're not, that isn't Led Zeppelin. I go, what? And he said, that's a, dog, a band called Greta Van Fleet out of Michigan. Wow. Then he pulls up on, the, on the, his phone an interview with Robert Plant. And Robert Plant talks about him. Talks about the Greta, Van, Greta Fleet. Van Fleet. And Robert Plant laughingly goes, somewhere I've heard that voice before. <laughs> and he goes, I'm jealous. Wow. Because he said, they're young and I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> well, youth becomes that great. I think youth. This guy, he's not quite totally Robert Plant. 
because he's a little rough on the edges with the little Getty Lee thrown in from mm-hmm. Rush. Yeah. Yeah, I can see he's got a little, not a feminine side, but a little bit more of that. But Plant had that. Yeah, yeah. Plant very much had a feminine side to his voice. He'd sing those slow, bluesy songs, drive my wife crazy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and to me, I don't care what anybody says, the best Zeppelin album is the first. Yeah. Is that when you went and saw him? Was around that time? Oh, no. I saw him in 72. Uh, thir- fourth had already been out because they did stay away that night. Where'd you go see him? San Diego. Who'd you go with? Do you remember? Uh, guys in the Navy. Yeah. I was in the Navy. I was back yeah. from my first tour to Vietnam. Wow. And uh, we went and saw Zeppelin. And uh, in fact, are we running? Oh, we're on? Can you hear us okay? Yeah, we're rolling. We can okay. cut any of the talk off. Oh, no, that's fine. Uh-huh. Then we're on and rolling, then yes, let's talk. We'll talk to Brian and Roll a little. Yeah, let's talk about to... it. No, I'm just curious. Sure. Yeah, uh, who, no, you, where, where, who you Where I with. was that weekend, uh, that was the toughest rock and roll weekend of my life was Led Zeppelin. I was, uh, it was 72, so I was t- about 21, I guess, 21 years old, maybe 20. And Zeppelin was Friday night. And Led Zepp played with no warm-up band, they would come out at 8 o'clock, and they would finish at 11.15, three hours and 15 minutes of Led Zeppelin. And the only break they ever took was during Moby Dick when John Bonham would do about a 15-minute drum solo. Man. Then the other three would walk off, drink their water, whatever they were going to do, have a cigarette yeah. you know, or whatever they were going to do, and then uh, come back out and at the end of Bonham's drum solo, and then they'd finish up. Well, I saw Zeppelin on Friday night, which was rugged, and we had to come back Saturday and then face Jethro Tull. Wow. Because that was the weekend. Zeppelin oh. Friday, Jethro Tull Saturday. And were you guys partying before? Like, were people partying pretty hard? Well, was this a drug in those da- well, no, no. In those days, open seating. So people con- were standing wherever. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, jeez. I used to bodyguard the bands when there was still right. open seating. Right craziness that open seating <laughs> ended in cleveland i think or somewhere at a who concert where the people trampled the death three or four people Jeez. died wow. and that's when the authorities came in like they always will as soon as people are dying yeah. <laughs> they're gonna come in and say wait a minute you're having fun but people are dying yeah, yeah. And so no and then they then they put on that you had to have tickets just to be on the main floor uh, and so they started the having started. security to where but in the early days oh you just packed in when i did the stones here yeah right they got the boards the hockey boards we would line up in the pit before the stone and you know the stones come out. We're the security down in the pit down mm-hmm. there, and they would tell us over the walkie-talkies, "Okay, we're opening the doors." You would literally feel the ground start shaking. Wow, like Sp- running of the bulls, and, and a slow roar would start, and then you'd look up, and you'd, the doors would open, and these guys would be running and literally diving down the stairs to get to the floor to be first in the wow. front row. And did you and feel like you're come, playing defense at that point? I no, mean, no, no, no. You got feel... the barricades okay. up. Right. They can only come up to the barricade, the hockey boards. Wow. You know, but they they pack in there so tight. This is before they had, when they had open seating, so tight that you'd see during a concert people raising their arms up down front waving them just to breathe probably. oh no 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 they can't bring them down wow uh, <laughs> they raise them up to get space and air <laughs> and then the wedge wedges them in so much they can't bring their arms <laughs> down <laughs> so they have to stand the rest of the show with their arms in the air or setting them on somebody else's shoulders or whatever i had a i, I, I had a little girl and i was in peak wrestling because i had had some knee surgery and i was at the prime of my wrestling when i was doing this uh-huh. and uh uh so i i i had a I was 265 pounds. Damn. You know, I was it could deadlift well in the 600. Oh, you, you know, could in the deadlift, deadlift a damn family. You know, I mean, I was I was a bruiser. You, you could know, deadlift six, four, a skinny two, family. 265 pounds, and had a little girl down front that wanted to get out. She couldn't take it no yeah. more. And what we do to people like that, we'd pull them out and then shuttle them down the line. They didn't get kicked out. We just let them in the back. Okay. Now the people that caused trouble. 
different story. Yeah. But like this young girl, she was just, she was crying, claustrophobic, couldn't take it no more. I had to stand on the boards, get under her armpits. <laughs> now I can deadlift over six hundred pounds. It was like pulling a cork out of a bottle <laughs> because of the compression. I had everything I could do. I broke into a sweat. Wow. Get, and finally I got her out and we got her down and she thanked me and we sent her down the line. Then on the flip side, I had some bozo start punching somebody. Oh. And his back was to me and he had long hair. I got up on the boards, yeah. got a hold of his hair, wound it into my hands oh, and yeah. removed him by the hair. Oh, damn. You can imagine what that felt like. Well, he hits the deck, jumps up, going to fight me, and I just looked at him and I said, think again. Yeah. <laughs> and he opened his hands up and backed up, and I said, get the F out of here. And we shuttled, and he went out the door. Yeah. You know, he didn't get let back in. He went out the back door. Do you miss I got to I got to introduce the Stones. Did you really? Yeah, because one night uh, during this, it was 78 or 81. I because think it was just, 81. You're a bouncer. You're, you're basically security. Security. But you're also wrestling at this point. Oh, yeah. But are you wrestling professionally? You're wrestling yeah. like, okay. No, I was pro. So people know who you are too sure. sometimes? Oh, wow. yeah. Gave me stuff to brag about on TV. Yeah. You know, gave me stuff for interviews, man. Oh, oh I bet. You know, I, I, they came out. Levy was the promoter, and he comes up to me, and I think it was 81. And he says to me, we'd have got no one to introduce the Stones. He goes, you want to do it? I said, hell yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. So, but, but here's what's good. They tell you exactly what you're to say, and you can't vary from it. Uh. You walk out under the spotlight, the whole 19,000 people or whatever at St. Paul Civic Center, and you simply walk up to the mic and you go, ladies and gentlemen, the world's greatest rock and roll band. The Rolling Stones, and you walk off. Damn. Does it but feel I pretty honorable? Good, I did get a good payback because that night at the end of the show, as they left the stage, Ronnie Wood looked at me and said, Hey, Jesse, how'd we do? Yeah. I said, Good, Woody, good. <laughs> <laughs> as you, um, I could tell you all sorts of rock and roll stories like really? that. Really? Oh, yeah. From, I, one time I got a signed Jagger where I just followed Mick around. So you're just doing security for him? Yeah. No, yeah. no. At, I did at security. The, the bands that would come to Minnesota. Okay. I didn't travel with them. Okay. We would get them here. Okay. And then we would provide security and ensure they got, once they were in the building, we had them, and we ensured they got in their limos. Right. Then they're on their own. So we, you know, or other wrestler, other rep, perform, no, do you just This is you A doing friend it. of mine. I yeah. knew I'd had some knee surgery, and he said, hey, you want to make 25 bucks a night and hear the best rock and roll in town? <laughs> and I loved rock and roll, and you got the best seat in the house, and they pay you 25 bucks or 50 yeah. bucks. I forget what it was you got paid for doing it. I said, sure, I'll do it. So I just go over there, and you just sit down in the pit, and I did Springsteen, Foreigner, Marshall Tucker, Grateful Dead. Damn. Did all of them, all the greats from that era. The Grateful Dead's the easiest. Is it really? Oh. They're the so dead, good, man. The Deadheads. Yeah. They all know each other. They yeah. travel. All, yeah. they, there's a group of fans that travel to every Dead concert. Oh, yeah. They're all doing grilled cheeses well, in no, their No, they're fans. Deadheads. Yeah. And they, they talk to each other. Bob, we missed you in Omaha. Yeah. Well, I couldn't make Omaha, <laughs> but I'll see you in East Lansing. Yeah. Okay. They all know each other. They don't even rush the stage. Yeah. The deadheads just dance around in the aisles. They, they're like hippies, you know? And the dead goes off on their tangents because no dead song's ever the same. You know, they, they take it any direction. Oh, yeah, they get real go. whimsical. Oh, yeah, and, and so that was the Grateful Dead. They were the easiest. Really? Oh, we left the front. Yeah. So there ain't nothing. <laughs> yeah. to worry. These guys, they, they, they all know the Grateful Dead. They're like friends. Yeah. <laughs> it's like playing a concert in front of your friends, <laughs> you know? And so, uh, yeah, I bet if you're, one of the, if you're one of them, you're just seeing the same people every yeah. night. Yeah. I mean, well, they change a little bit. Like Bob couldn't make Omaha, you know. Right. So. <laughs> but I think I was on LSD just because I would see the same people in the crowd every night. I'd be like, damn. <laughs> so maybe they thought that too. I don't know. This is a but Groundhog no, they, Day. I did all the bands back then, and and uh, uh, it was a great experience. Was there a point that you quit? Or did work just get too busy? Oh no, no, I went back wrestling. You went back wrestling. Oh yeah, no, no, no. Uh, that's right. Mean, you can't. You ain't gonna survive doing what I was doing. Right. You know, not in the lifestyle I preferred to live. Yeah. That was just busy work and fun, you know, and, and, uh, and it paid off later because here's the story later. On uh, 1998, I became the governor of Minnesota. Yeah. 
I took office in 1999. And uh, 1999 was the Rolling Stones No Security Tour. That's what it was called. Yeah. They came to Minnesota in February of 99. Wow. I'm the governor now. And so as governor, and here's what I did. I had never did a governor's proclamation, you know, where the governor proclaims something. Yeah. So being the outlaw I am and the governor of belonging to neither political party, which gave me great freedom in many ways, uh, my first thing as governor, I declared it the day that the Stones played here in the No Security Tour in 99, I declared it Rolling Stones Day in Minnesota. Now, it went to the Secretary of State because they have to sign off on it too, right? And I won't say names, but we had this kind of tight ass Republican woman. Mm-hmm. It from you know, do I need to say more? No, we can easily okay. see, find you can, out who you it can, is. You can figure it out, right? She knows she wasn't going to sign it. Oh. I picked up my phone in the governor's office. I called her up. I said, whatever her name was, I, I just, first name. I said, sign the proclamation. Don't make me come down there. Yeah. And I set the phone down. Yeah. The proclamation was back in about five minutes. Dude, that's <laughs> signed. awesome. She we... signed off. I said, give me a break. Yeah, what are we doing? And Well, the great payoff came that night because that night I was there to when the Stones were. And they had been greeted at the airport by the press. And they asked Mick Jagger, how do you feel? The governor declared it Rolling Stones Day in Minnesota. And Mick said, we were very honored. They said, no one's ever did that for us before. Wow. You know, we've never come to a state and had the state declare it our day. Yeah. <laughs> so they were very honored. Did they remember you that you did security? Well, that's coming up. Okay. And so uh, we come there that night and I get my picture taken with them and up comes my favorite stone, Keith Richards. Yeah. And so <laughs> Keith comes up to me that night and his hair is all Good away. Hair. And typical Keith Richards, a headband on. He's got this hanging off here of the hair and that hanging off there of the hair. And he looks up at me. In typical Keith Richards style, and he goes, uh, so you used to bodyguard us back in 78 and 81, huh? You know, somebody told him that, I'm sure. And I go, yep. And he goes, and now you're the governor. And I go, yep. And in the great Keith Richards Cockney accent, I'll remember it the rest of my life, he looks at me and goes, fucking great. (laughs) I'll never forget it. (laughs) Fucking great. You know, and just smiled at me. And I thought, well, if you get an effing great from Keith Richards, you've done something right, is how I view it. Do you feel... uh, (laughs) Oh, I I agree. I mean, do you feel that... Uh, so stuff like that, that's kind of feels like, co- do you feel like that's coincidence? Do you feel like there's a, high- I-, I find it interesting when you're, you're able to live life long enough, how things intertwine a lot and how amazingly something comes back. Like a helicopter you launched 20 years ago comes and lands on your palm like a butterfly now. Or like a boomerang. Yes. That's a perfect analogy. <laughs> do you think that there's any God in that? Or do you just think that no. that's just nature? That's the no, way I it believe, works. No, I believe like, uh, like, uh, 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 Neil deGrasse Tyson says, it's chaos. Yeah. He said, there's no one in control of space. Yeah. Neil said, everything is flying around out there. There ain't nothing in control of nothing. It's chaos. And I, my belief in life is this. Having, I didn't plan to be governor. I didn't sit back when I was 18, 20 years old and say, you know, I'm going to take political science. Someday I'm going to run for governor, be mayor first. I'm going to be a mayor first, then I'm going to be governor. I didn't plan nothing like that. I didn't even plan to wrestle. Yeah, Things just fell into place. And I I lived by a premise that I think I've I've mentioned it, a quote from the great Yogi Berra, the baseball player. I don't know how familiar we are with Yogi, but Yogi used to say some great one-liners, and Yogi's one great one-liner was, if you come to a Y in the road, take it. Mm. Keep going. No, think. Uh. You come to a Y in the road, take it. Mm. Well, that means you got to pick one way or the other. That's what he's telling you. Right. So I've come to Ys in the road, and I've taken them. And once I've picked out which of the why I'm going on, I don't look back. Right. And I and I conquer. 
whatever that why is taking me to. Then when I achieve that, I look for the next why in the road. Wow. And then I do that. Because I've had so many jobs now. Oh, yeah, it's baffling. I, I, I sit back and look at it and go, how? You know, I guess... When you look, I get bored after about four years. Really? Mm-hmm. And then I need the why in the road. Yeah. I need to go out and, because f- I mean, I. Where, where do you think that comes from, Jesse? And not to interrupt you, I just, uh, you know, I'm curious. Like, it's a certain wanderlust that I think you're born with. Is it? Do you read, think you inherit? Well, you don't I've think read it? two books on Che Guevara. Right. And one book was written by a South American, so you got a real good view of Che. It wasn't right. written by a United States pre- person with great bias right you know you got it from a south american which is argentina's where che was from and che had it che couldn't stay somewhere i mean he had he had it made in cuba right he was like god in cuba yeah and he was handsomer than fidel well and they put him up he's he's there i've been to cuba yeah same he's on he's on that building oh their libraries their libraries start with books on che and fidel there's no history before them they had che didn't stay did he they were heroes che didn't stay did he kind of heroes no no he needed something else it's he almost like that. He couldn't stay. It's like Brad Pitt in that it, movie. He couldn't stay. And right. that's me. There's a times come on certain jobs I do where I can't stay no more. Yeah. That I got I to gotta go on. I got to move. I got to get go, keep going. Maybe, maybe I'm giving up the day that I say, okay, this is it. Right. You know, I'm not, this is, I'm on the final why in the road. But I ain't there yet, I don't think. I'm 70 now. Wow. But uh, that's why I moved to Mexico 15 years ago. Oh, I didn't even know that. Oh, yeah. I've been living in Mexico for 15 years every winter. I live an hour from pavement and an hour from electricity. And has that been? do you feel like that's been beneficial? I live off the grid. Wow. Who do you take with you down there? I take my pickup truck, my wife, and my dog. And was there a reason you guys chose down that area? Was there... No. Yeah. Just kind of worked out. Because uh, like my life, a why came in the road. Yeah. I took it. No, what happened on that deal was I had just come out of office and I needed a break of being governor. And I just inked a huge contract with MSNBC, right? Mm-hmm. You notice I was never on. I was going to say I'd never seen any clips of this. Yeah. No, because I was never on. The reason we'll get back, but I'll cover this because I've covered it before. And I like people to know, by the way. I'm going to do a shameless plug here on your thing. Please do. I'm I'm now on Clubhouse. Okay. And, okay, and so it's people called can... the governor's office. Okay. <laughs> so anybody that wants to tune me in can go to Clubhouse in the governor's office. Okay. And I'm on Sunday night at seven central, mm-hmm. and Wednesday night at seven central. Okay. I go on an hour each those nights. So anybody out there that does this and wants to hear more from me, that's where they can. They can go. do it there. Yeah. Is there something interfering with your happiness? Do you have you ever had happiness? That's a question I've also often asked myself. Do I have have ever had happiness? And I don't know. Sometimes I have moments of it, flashes. But I've ever had a real soup of it. I don't know. Is it possible for me? That's a question I have oftentimes. Better help can help. If there are questions about your mental and well-being and your depression and anxiety, you need answers. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches that make it easy and free to change counselors if you need. You can Zoom with them. You can um, rock with them. Zoom with them. Rock with them. You can uh, do on the phone. You can even text them. You know, if, you, if, you, if you're having trouble getting help in your area, don't give up on getting help. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Theo. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash Theo. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. I've gotten BetterHelp. And TPW listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Theo. Learning a new language. Have you ever tried that? Have you ever tried to learn a new language? Were you in high school and you tried it? Didn't happen, did it? Are you Spanish? Well, anything can happen, thanks to Babbel, the number one selling language learning app. Oh, the whole process is addictively fun. Become 
the the linguist you want. You want to talk to somebody who's Russian? Learn how to. Spanish, French, they got it all. They teach bite-sized language lessons for real-world use. Damn, you can use it at the Starbucks. Oh, the Starbucks. With Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages. Babbel's speech recognition technology helps you improve your pronunciation and accent. accent. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months free. That's six months. That's Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com, code Theo. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com, code Theo. Theo, a three-month Babbel subscription, get three months free language for life. Anyway, getting back to uh, what were we talking about now? Well, I guess, <laughs> you know. I mean, there's different areas that I like. No, no, no. You no, took no. So when you got to the end of your governorship, oh, yeah. were you exhausted? Here, no, yeah. I, I, and I just, well, I had signed with MSNBC. Right. Well, I got paid for three years and did nothing. And I got paid a lot of money. Why? Because I opposed the invasion of Iraq. They wouldn't put me on television. Really? Nobody was allowed on TV who opposed the invasion of Iraq. I'll give you the example. MSNBC at that, when I got out of office, Fox, MSNBC, and CNN got in a bidding war for me. I was the voice of the independent. Mm -hmm. Oh, 100%. Voice of the independent. Don't belong to either party. Yeah. MSNBC won. I signed a three-year contract with them. And I'll just state this. It was a contract that a professional sports athlete would get. Wow. Not not a hundred million. Yeah. But it was healthy. Yeah. It was very nice. Yeah. I'll say that. And so I signed a three-year contract with them, and we insisted that they were going to do my show in Minnesota. Because I number Damn. one, I didn't want to leave here. Of course not. Make it easy on yourself. Yeah. So yeah, you were living high. And I had the power. At that time. So I said, no, I want to do the show in Minnesota. And here's what I sold them on. Because all you people do is cover the coasts. Yeah. Nobody gets a Midwestern perspective of nothing. And we're the heart of America. Amen. We're the heart of America. Amen. You know, so uh, they agreed. So go over to Channel 2 here in the Twin Cities. I provided 30 jobs or something because wow. they had to hire all these people to work on yeah. the show. So I provide all these jobs after I get out, right? And one of the jobs was to my head of communication when I was governor. He now stayed with me and was working on the show with wow. me. So did you go to one day of work at all? No, wait. No. Okay, so, sorry. So, so, so. <laughs> we're You're ramp- easy. I don't even they, have to ask well, you they anything. Send, they good. send a, a, a producer out. Okay. From the base, MSNBC. So he's producing the show. We're getting all set to go on the air. Live audience now. We're going to have a live audience because I play better. Yeah. In front of oh. live, you know, and it's everything's ready to go. And all of a sudden we get a phone call. Here's the phone call. Oh, let me add MSNBC had just hired Phil Donahue, oh. the king of daytime. He yeah. was now on at night. He was their highest rated show. Really? Phil likewise opposed the invasion of Iraq yeah. and said it publicly. So had I. We get a phone call. John, my subordinate, at the, right, took the call. Guy. I didn't yeah. get the call. He got the call. Here's the call. Um, this is, so, is it true Governor Ventura doesn't support the invasion of Iraq? John, oh no, he's vehemently opposed to it. He's a Vietnam veteran. He said, this is Vietnam all over again. This is crap. This is nation building. This, they didn't attack us. Iraq didn't attack us on 9-11. Yeah. Why are we invading Iraq? Yeah, a lot of people you know? wondered. And, and so then the next question, does Connecticut know about this? Well, here's the tie-in. MSNBC stood for Microsoft NBC. At that time, okay. it was a partnership between Microsoft and NBC. Ah. Who owned NBC at that time? ESPN. General Electric. Oh, really? General Electric is one of the biggest war profiteers in the world. Damn. They are, they are the military industrial complex and part of it. Because they have all those contracts with them? Wow. Everything is built by GE to go to war. Yeah. A lot of it. Right? Oh, I'll probably have a gun. So do they want one of their announcers on TV opposing a war? Not a chance. 
Damn. Exactly. So that was the, does Connecticut know about this was the second question. We respond, or John responded, I don't know. Pause. Here's the big question. Is there any chance he changes mind? Wow. John said, I don't think so. He said, I've seen the governor change his mind where, because he wasn't educated on something well enough. And when he got educated, he took a different viewpoint. Right. But he said, this is war. He's a veteran. He's opposed to it. He's a Vietnam veteran. You ain't going to change his mind. Guess what? I didn't go on the air. Wow. And guess what? Phil Donahue got pulled. Damn. They pulled both of us. Have you ever heard of a network pulling their highest rated show? No. Never. But they did because they wanted no negative to invading Iraq Damn. on the mainstream media. So that's how powerful those tie-ins are between yes. like these companies and the corporations and the mainstream media. And the government. Yeah. Wow. And the government. So do you feel sometimes it used to feel like one thing that's tougher as I've learned more as I as I get older and just learn more, sometimes it almost... You're going to find out you're going to learn even more. <laughs> sometimes I don't want to. How old are you? I'm 40 years old, man. Oh, you got a lot of learning Fuck, left, dude, no, you youngster. I don't want to anymore. <laughs> you're just beginning to learn. I don't want to, man. <laughs> you're I, just beginning. But I feel like All it's you've painful. done is crack the door open a little. <laughs> but do you ever think sometimes that it's this almost a, a more blissful value and not... No, like, they say knowledge is power and sometimes it just almost hurts me sometimes the more i learn stuff sometimes it feels yeah. de- makes me feel debilitated but, sometimes but you have to know you can't live a life in my opinion you can't live a life without truth i finish every show i do i always say and always remember people when the government lies the truth becomes a traitor mm. Mm. now think of that quote that's an original from me i'm thinking when about it right government now government lies The truth becomes a traitor. In other words, they'll take the truth and put the truth in jail. And make it the enemy. Wow. And they'll make the truth the enemy. You see it all the time right now. Well, I feel like we're that's never seemed more prevalent than right now, right? Yep. Do you feel like... um, And yet, I will back, there is good government. Right. Don't think for a moment that I'm I'm not a Trumpy. I want you to know that right now. You know... I don't even want to get into my feelings on him. Yeah, and as an ex-military man, right? There's a lot to unpack and, there with and that. To me, January sixth was an attempted coup d'état. Really? Absolutely. Look at the, what they're learning now. Yeah, they had the format all laid out. Oh yeah, it almost seemed like one of his you shady know where contractors he sits could and have tells set it up. Hillary Clinton lock her up. Yeah, there's the guy that belongs in jail. Right, Donald Trump. He tried to overthrow our country. He defied the Constitution. Do you now, think... Now, I live by the Constitution. Right. That's the document I live by. If you don't like it, change it. But you got to have a set of rules. Yeah. Those are the rules. He broke them. Yeah. He broke the rules. Yeah. He should never be allowed to run again. Yeah. And in far as I'm concerned, he belongs in jail because people died that day. Right. On an insurrection to overturn our government. Right. It's that simple. And I don't care how these Republicans want to butter the bread. You're talking to the independent here. Yeah. And you know what part angered me the most? What is it? When I saw a Confederate flag carried through my capital. Yeah. Well, does that make you feel I call, what? You know what I call the Republicans now? The Taliban. Really? <laughs> They're the American Taliban, baby. <laughs> And that's coming from Jesse the Body, the yeah. American Taliban. Well, look what they're doing in Texas. Yeah. What? Oh, where's women's rights? Yeah. The Taliban have got them down there. You know, they're taking away people's right to vote. Did you know it's easier to buy a gun in Texas than vote? Yeah, that's insane. That, that's that. insanity. You want the definition of insanity? There's a good one yeah. right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And now this latest thing. What was the latest thing that crazy governor? Oh, he's now over. The governor is, is now overruling mask mandates. Yeah. In other words, no one in Texas can make you wear a mask. Okay. Well, what about this then? Does it, let me ask you this. Do you feel like. And by uh, the way, I love the mask. Right. You know why? I wrote an op-ed piece. It gave me freedom. Yeah. I can go in the store now. Yeah. Nobody bothers me. And if I keep my mouth shut, nobody does. And I don't have to talk to people that I probably didn't want to talk to anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
You see little Jesse the Bodies coming out. Oh, man. yeah, that's good, man. The old villain. Fuck, I'm ready yeah. to get body slammed. You know well, you know saying? why the villain's coming out? Why? I got people criticizing me now saying I've sold out because I got vaccinated. Mm-hmm. What a crock of crap. Well, I sold out because I want to live. Right. And I look at the statistics, and when 99% of the vaccine people live and only 1% die, I'm going on the 99 side, people. But do you under? But Jesse, why do you think? Do you want? Is it able? To, are you able to like have an idea of why some people think? I feel like the news made things very confusing. The news started yeah. becoming like sure. not information, and a lot of people got extremely scared and didn't know who to believe anymore. Well, here you go. You want the answer to the news? Yeah, Jesse has it. Yeah, I'd like a. Here you know, go. I wouldn't mind a dose of it, man, because that's where I feel like a lot of bad information started. The downfall of the news came with the show sixty minutes now you guys are all going to sit and go no i like i i how could you 60 minutes that's an award-winning investigative reporting show which it is and it's a great show yeah, I used and to it love was it. a great show still is probably a great show but 60 minutes was the downfall of the american media why well, is that when they started editorializing it uh-uh uh-uh but prior to 60 minutes all the news lost money, and the, they made up for it in the entertainment division, uh-huh. and that was a standard rule. The news is to educate. The news is to do this. The news don't make money. It's to inform. Along came the show 60 Minutes. It shot to number one yeah. in the ratings. The bean counter's eyes got big, and they went, you mean we can make money off the news? Yeah. That's what 60 Minutes caused, making profit off the news. Then it became about ratings rather than informing. Now the news is nothing but entertainment. Right. So and now- it's there to get ratings points. It's there to make money for advertisers. Yeah. Where in the days of Walter Cronkite, back when I was younger than you, the news lost money. You want the show that was so ahead of its time, the movie that it's scary today for me to watch it? Watch the show Network. Yeah. With Faye Dunaway, uh, William Holden. Yeah, I've seen that. It's good. And Peter Finch won yeah. the Academy Award for playing Howard Beale. Because he just got so real, and that's and it changed well, everything, no, right? no, that's where it became entertainment. Right. Remember, they brought Faye yes. Dunaway in from entertainment yes. to get the ratings. She was the new producer. And this was done before it ever happened to the news. Yeah, they call up to her desk, and she's it like, was no, done let him before go, let him go. They knew 60 Minutes had changed it. Yeah. So that movie, whoever wrote the script or yeah. whatever, Can you ask him to shut that off? Was, was looking into the future and had their thumb right on the button. Wow. Because that's what our media or our news has turned into, the movie network. So then, the, but It's this, all about ratings points now, guys. It ain't about making you smarter or giving you information. It's about titillate. Look at right now. Oh, t- What's the big news out there right now? Another missing white girl. Yeah. Now, if that girl was black, you think they'd be all at f- front page stories every night? If it was a, a black, lot of black girl missing? A black people don't go hiking, really, though. But may, probably not. Maybe not. You know, maybe not. Black girls disappear every day. Yeah. And you don't see, though, where they isolate every all people disappear every day, probably. But why is it that they pick out the cute, right, there's the this cute little looking little white girl? In distress, yeah. Yeah. The cute little. And, and don't get me wrong. It's a tragedy. It's yeah. horrifying. Whatever happened to her. Don't get me wrong on that. No, totally. But I the feel media, you. I'm just thinking The about media's it. coverage of it, it's okay. When I was going to do the show for MSNBC, mm-hmm. everything comes down from on high. Yeah. They tell you what they're, like Hannity and these guys, they get told what to talk about. Oh, totally, yeah. You know, oh, I fought them. them. You know what they sent me every day? Lacey Peterson. What? And I said, that's a tragedy, but there's 10,000 murders a year. Why is this one exceptional? And why should people in Minnesota or in the East Coast care about a murder that took place out in California? Yeah. Yes, we feel sad Lacey was murdered. Like I feel sad that anybody else gets murdered. But why would I on a national TV show give five minutes of the show's time covering a murder that affects that when you have 10,000 of them a year? Yeah. So, 
But, but so okay with that said th that's no. where i feel like where do people go to get good information and that becomes the scary part that's how things a well, lot of things become fragmented you. remember when larry king died oh yeah now larry king was an icon i got to go on his show one time man pretty cool oh yeah larry king an icon i did a show a number of times i feel fortunate larry king talked to everyone yeah well they did all these tributes to larry right which they should, well-deserved. But they left out the last five years of Larry's life. They stopped the tributes when he left CNN. Do you know where he went? To OAN, right? To his no, own. he went to where I work, Russian Television America. Oh, really? RT America. Larry King was there for Aura. over was five years. Was he on years. Aura? Was it a branch oh, of no, the same thing? No, Aura was a podcast owned by Larry. I worked for him. Oh, interesting. I did a podcast called Off the Grid on Aura, where I did it from Mexico. Oh, wow. I'd come into town once a week, and they'd put me up at the hotel. I'd play two rounds of golf, and I'd do Aura and go back to my house. It was great. So they but quit anyway, supporting him whenever he went and did his own thing. Larry worked for RT, Russian wow. television. My Aura thing... I had a problem with them in negotiations. Russian TV came in and said, we'll take you. So I went with RT America, where Larry was. For five years, Larry King worked at RT America. That is Russian Television America. And you know what he said? Mm. He said, this is the most honest news people are going to get. Mm. And this came from the icon Larry King, who our mainstream media didn't want that quote out there. So they didn't cover the last five years of Larry's life. So. They made Larry retire after CNN. Larry wasn't retired. Larry was on every week like I am on RT America. Yeah. And before I signed with RT, they flew me and my wife to Moscow. Really? I went, yes, I went to their 10th anniversary of RT. No. Uh, I met Gorbachev that night, what? and uh, Putin was the keynote speaker. Wow. And at the end of the night... Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, walked over to me. I didn't walk over to him. He walked over to me. Did you stand up or you I in your chair? Absolutely. He's the president. Yeah, I yeah. stood up. He offered his hand. I shook his hand. Putin looked at me and said, thank you, governor. And I said, you're welcome, Mr. President. And then he said, I want you to know, I, I, I will never interfere in your television show. You have complete control and complete artistic freedom. Hmm. And I said, thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate that. And guess what? I've been there four years now, and he's been a man of his word. Have you, yeah, he you, has never interfered in my show. Nobody tells me what I can say or can't say. They don't tell me what I can or can't talk about. Now, isn't it strange? I'm banned from TV in America. Wow. I'm banned. And that's because of my court case. They all came into my court case to have it overturned. Oh, when you... Um, the Chris Kyle mess. Oh, yeah. The lie about me. Yeah, The yeah. Chris Kyle lie. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, well, what people don't know, at the, at the at, two judges at the Court of Appeals broke two of their own rules and sided with the media and overturned my case, breaking their rules to do it. So how do we defeat... And, 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 and in doing so, where can I go to work? Yeah. These people interfere. I was, you know, they interfered in my court case. So I have, I can, and so I work for RT now, and it's the, they're the best. Do you know what they did for me? Mm. Yeah. I start, and they were sending me to a studio, right? Mm -hmm. And Misha, my boss, he goes, uh, you know, that's expensive and it's really out of the way for you. He's a Russian. Mm -hmm. He said, do you have room in your house? I said, sure. I said, I got a, a bedroom down in my basement. I kind of call it my trophy room. I keep all my trophy paraphernalia down there in the corner of the house. And nobody can see it unless I take them down there. He said, could we put a studio in there? Wow. I said, sure. All of a sudden, Amazon boxes start arriving at my house. <laughs> Technicians come. They took out all the permits. They wire me up. Ba boom, ba boom. The cameras, the lights. I now do my show from my basement. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm in Minneapolis, they're in D.C., and my partner's in L.A., yeah. and they have the capability now that we can do a complete show and never even be in the same city with each other. Does that's it, something, the it's technology. Amazing. Well, it's amazing. I mean, do you, and so that's how I do my show. I walk downstairs, and, uh, and I'm happy to say my son is home now. He worked for RT, for, still working for them. 
and uh, he came home, and uh, he now uses my studio to stay working with RT. Oh, wow. And he's back home, which makes his mom and me very happy. You're always happy when the the son comes back, even when he's 41 or 42 now. Is that your only <laughs> child? No, I have a daughter. Oh, yeah? She lives here. Oh, she does? Yeah, she's married and lives here. But oh. my son's more of the, the, he's more of his dad. Really? Traveling. Oh, yeah, he's, he hasn't lived here for 20 years. He graduated from high school and left. Wow. He, he was a Sean Penn's assistant. Oh, really? He had yeah. that wander thing in him, huh? Oh, yeah, and he went with well, Sean Penn. I remember the time he called me. He says, hey, Dad. I said, yeah. He says, guess where I'm going tonight? I said, where? He says, uh, he's over at, I'm at the Cannes Film Festival. We're having a party with the Victoria's Secret models. Damn. And I said to him over the phone, I said, well, you ought to enjoy yourself. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I used to masturbate to their magazines, man. Remember when that magazine came in the mail? Those are the what, good Victoria old days. Oh. Yeah. Well, he calls me, said, oh, yeah, we're going to a party tonight. With the Victoria's Damn. Secret models. <laughs> I go, well, that ought to be fun. Yeah, that ought to be No, he, he, my son left at 20. Yeah. You know, and he, took, he was Sean Penn's assistant for a while, and then he lived and worked in L.A. for 10 years. And then an opportunity opened up for him at RT America. And he was on the ground floor. He got into RT when they were a few rooms on a floor. Now they're two complete floors of a building wow. out now, in D.C. Does it feel, does, is it strange that, that it's a Russian company and that they're making, uh, like... Well, they're technically not they're an american company right i'm just wondering is there any like but you know what i they i have to do i have to because i work for them wait till you hear this bullshit mm -hmm. <laughs> because i work for them i they i'm i have to file as a foreign agent oh really yeah huh now they don't make people on al jazeera do that they don't make people on uh any of these, uh, the, the BBC don't have to do that. So the IRS only, is making you do that? On, no, the government. Oh, the, oh, the government's making not you do that? Not the IRS. Okay. IRS has nothing to do with it. Okay. It's the government. We have to file with the Department of Justice because as foreign agents. Now, I take offense to that. Yeah. I'm born and raised here. I'm a United States citizen. I've been a mayor. I've been a governor. I'm an honorably discharged Vietnam veteran, and I have paid taxes to this country my entire adult life, unlike Donald Trump. Yeah. I pay my taxes. Yeah. I participate. I don't cheat. So having said that, I'm now considered a foreign agent. Right. Damn. Does that kind of stuff make... Oh, at the start of the show, it says how our show has to be... It's cleared by the Department of Justice. It has to go to them. Does it really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they ain't done nothing. I mean, I say what I want right. to say. But I'm sure I'm on some list, yeah. and I'm sure I'm under observation, <laughs> you know, <laughs> from cool. these bozos. Does and it... yet I stand up for them yeah. against the insurrection. Does it make you feel like... I used to feel like when I was younger and stuff, when I was a kid, How that there was... How long have we gone? We're having fun here. How long? About 45 minutes. Oh, so Are we got we really? 15 to go then. Wow. <laughs> That's I... about the time I'll run out of voice, man. Okay, no worries. <laughs> um, I used to feel like as a kid, like there was this American dream. There was this red, white, and blue thing, and we we're all part of this group. Like, And sometimes I feel like I don't feel that way anymore sometimes. And it's not like I don't know if it's a choice I'm making not to feel that way. You know what made me change Way back when I, when, uh, during Vietnam, when I saw the draft, it was the draft because the rich kids didn't have to go. Yeah. Donald Trump got bought his way out of it. Yeah. He, he was going to get drafted and his dad went and paid off and he got bone spurs. Really? He's never missed a round of golf. He probably got him in his penis, I but, bet. No, no, too. no. Bone spurs in his feet. Yeah, and he had, I've never seen him miss a round of golf. <laughs> could you imagine I mean, though, with, with a weapon? Those bone spurs would be painful. How the yeah. hell could he play golf? He'd bring a sandwich. What a to the gutsy front guy! Yeah. What a gutsy <laughs> to withstand that pain and swing that golf club. I mean, there's a true tough leader, isn't that? What would you do if you didn't have high interest loans, huh? Imagine, imagine what you'd be doing out there with your cash, getting something for yourself, get you a couple candies or something, get your little cousin a little butterfinger. Get him a new baseball mitt. You could do a lot. If you're carrying a credit balance month after month, ooh, that's heavy. That's that Django, baby. You don't want it. It can feel like you're in a never-ending cycle of debt with no end in sight. That ain't you, fam. Upstart is the fast and easy way to pay off your debt with a personal loan. All online. You don't have to go anywhere. Changing your credit, changing your financial 
picture without going anywhere. Rather than looking at credit score alone, Upstart considers other factors like your income, current employment, and credit history to find you a smarter rate for your loan. They do the work. Yep, loans between $1,000 to $50,000. Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments today. Go to upstart.com slash Theo. That's upstart.com slash T-H-E-O. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit income and certain information provided in your loan application. Upstart.com slash Theo. The holidays are right around the corner. And if you don't believe that, then just go ask anybody. Anybody will tell you that. And it's that time to give somebody something. Something that means something, especially in this busy world. You want to make a connection with your loved ones. That's why paintyourlife.com, you can have an original painting by a world-class artist done by hand from any photo at an affordable price. Now think about that. You have a photo you love. Maybe it's you and grandma out there doing badminton or you guys, you know, you and, uh, you and your cousin having a cigarette on the porch after work. Could be anything. Well, you can get a professional hand-painted portrait created from any photo at an affordable price. Send in any picture or combine photos into one painting with Paint Your Life's compilation portraits. You can bring together family members who never even had the chance to meet. Very special. Yep, at paintyourlife.com, there's no risk. If you don't love the final painting, your money's refunded, guaranteed. And right now, as a limited time offer, get 20% off your painting. That's right, 20% off and free shipping. To get this special offer, text the word WEEKEND to 64-000. That's WEEKEND, W-E-E-K-E-N-D, to 64-000. Text WEEKEND to 64-000. Paint your life. Celebrate the moments that matter most and support the podcast. You know. Do you feel like the leadership that we have in now is... No. They're all as bad. The Dems and Repubs. I side with Ralph Nader, yeah. who called it correctly when he said we're under the rule of a two-party dictatorship. Yeah. And the reason I say that is because you notice there's no problem passing the defense bill. Right. Boy, they all jump on board for that, don't they? Because they're all making money Ain't on it, no right? no argument about that. How about the latest? Did you hear the latest? We're 31 of them. They passed a law in 2012. They are not allowed to trade stocks on the stock market and invest, right? Mm -hmm. 31 of them just got caught for insider trading. Wow. You know what the biggest penalty they're going to face? A $200 fine. fine. Yeah. After they probably made hundreds of thousands on the stock market, they'll pay a $200 fine. Now, it seems to me Charlie Sheen went to jail in Wall Street for that. Yeah. Remember Oliver's movie, Oliver Stone's movie, Wall Street? Oh, yes, I yeah. remember it. Charlie Sheen went to jail for insider trading for, you know, and then he got a lighter sentence because he turned Gecko over to him. Yeah. You know, Gordon Gecko. So but, he cooperated. But that is against the law. And the point is, all 37 of these people should be made to resign right now. Yeah, agree. And I'll tell you why. Because. It is so basic that when you get elected, you do not make decisions and do not to profit yourself. Right. And when you're doing insider trading, trading that nobody else knows about but you. It's cheating. That's cheating and that's illegal yeah. and people go to prison for it. And 37 of our illustrious elected officials, you notice how these guys go in there. They're not millionaires, many of them, but they all come out millionaires. Yeah. Well, those jobs don't pay that much. I'll tell you this, that's the reason I didn't, one of the major reasons I didn't seek a second term as governor. You know how much money I was making? Probably 2000 a week. <laughs> how much, 25 No, I'll tell you exactly. Okay, the governor got paid 120000 a year. Okay, so about 2000 right. a week. Now they're going to take taxes out. Right. Okay, well, I also get deducted mileage for the official governor's car unless during the work day. Mm -hmm. So to and from the Capitol, I have to pay for it till I get to the Capitol. Mm. Oh. So wait, so I went to them and said, well, 
okay, I'll drive my private car to the Capitol and then I'll get in the governor's car and I won't get docked money. Public safety comes in, it's a catch-22. You can't do that. Mm. Why? Well, that's the car with all the protection and the radios and all this. So they make you ride in the car and then charge you for it. Oh, damn. And it don't end there. The governor's residence, every meal that me and my family ate there was deducted from my paycheck. I had to turn in weekly things on how many meals were served to me and my family at the governor's residence unless it was official. State business. So that would get deducted. It ended up, here, okay, get ready. Now I'm in charge of a $16 billion budget, right? I, cl- I was clearing at best sixty grand a year. Wow. Now, Jesse Ventura has a lifestyle that if I'm making sixty grand a year, I'm sinking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not even treading water. Right. I'm sinking. Yeah. You know, and that was one of the major, re- and I wouldn't corrupt. I suppose I could have been corrupt and who knows what I might have made and what kind of job I would have gotten after I got out. Because, you know, they always seem to land on their feet with some real great paying job. Oh, yeah. Nobody can, you know, the, the greatest thing I got getting out of office, hmm. the thing I hold in the highest esteem, I got to be a fellowship professor at Harvard. Hmm. 2004. And how did that work? How did that come to They happen? sent me a letter. Oh, yeah? And they said, how would you like to teach in the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University? Oh, that's sweet. And I turned to my wife. I said, is this for freaking real? I said, I only went to high school. Yeah. I went in the Navy <laughs> on high school. Yeah. They're asking me to come and teach at Harvard. They need Harvard. teachers, I think, everywhere. No, 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 no. This is 2003. Oh, yeah. They, they need no teachers. This is Harvard. They don't need teachers at Harvard. <laughs> yeah, no shortage there. Yeah. You know? And uh, and so I, I took it for the whole year. They, they paid me a stipend. I got paid every month. They moved me into an apartment on, on the business school right on campus. Cool. And I would walk across the Charles River every morning to an office I had. I learned how to do the computer there, and I actually sent an email. And then as soon as I left Harvard, I forgot the computer and haven't sent an email since. <laughs> you know, so Harvard taught me that, and I quickly forgot it. Do you know I've never owned a cell phone? Really? Mm-mm. And I've made it my life's mission now. I do. I will not own one. I will do everything in my power not to get one. Wow. I want to be able to put on my gravestone, he never owned a cell phone. And I figure if I last 10 more years, you got it. I may be the only person on the planet that can write that. Damn. Although I am running into some people that say their grandparents are holding out. Yeah, they're holding out. So I got to outlive them. You also started. You know, that's group, yeah. my key now. I got to oh. outlive the the elderly. <laughs> but no, I hire never, a hitman. And people have said to me, "Well, how could you be governor?" Simple, and it was even better. I had two bodyguards, twenty four seven. They had them. Yeah. So they screen calls. Oh, Anybody that's nice. wants to talk to me, they call them. That edit, that edit. They cover. Governor so and so is calling. Oh. Tell him I'll call him back at 5 that I'm busy right now, but I will get back to him. I'm sorry. The governor is not available right now, but he do, he is aware of your situation and said he'll get back to you at 5 o'clock today. Nice. Okay. Very good. Thank you. That way you got a built-in yeah. call screener. If you got your own cell phone, uh, it's, it's the worst. you ain't got a call screener. You don't have a life anymore either. I've you know, got to ask you this, Well, Jesse. you know what's interesting? <sighs> I've gone, I've said that to people, uh-huh. and people have looked at me, and they've actually looked at me sincerely and replied, you're lucky. Wow. Oh, yeah. And I often think to myself, why are they saying that to me? Why are they telling me I'm lucky not to have a cell phone? And I think it's because it's it's beginning to dominate people's lives. Oh, yeah. To where they have nothing else but the cell phone. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, I'd hate that existence. I went out to Sirius Radio once, mm-hmm. and you know they put you in the green room. Oh yeah, yeah I've been. There, yeah. I always hated the in green. In New York, do you like the green room? I hate it. You I know don't why? Like it that much? No, you know why I hate the green room? Why? Because that's what they call the room at San Quentin where they put you to death. Oh really? It's called the green room. Oh damn! It's where they go before they pump you full of electricity. Oh in the yeah. The old days. 
Well, anyway, I'm at the green room at Sirius, right? There's probably a dozen people there. Every one of them is staring at their cell phone but me. And I'm looking around the room, and I finally thought, screw this. <clears throat> so I fucking did what I needed to do to command the room. Yeah. And I looked at him and said, have any of you noticed in this room that I'm the only person here not looking at a cell phone? And they all look around at each other sheepishly. And I just kind of shake my head. I just wanted to bring it to their attention. It's a freedom, That I was the only person in this room of a dozen people who wasn't staring. Yeah. Or doing, manipulating something on... You know, oh yeah, and thank so- God we sent Captain Kirk up to space now, because now it's timely. Everybody's got the communicators, right, right, that they had on Star Trek. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The only thing you can't do now is send yourself places, but I'm sure that's coming. Fuck, that's gonna be scary. <laughs> but, that's gonna be real scary. Do you know I interviewed him, Captain Kirk? Oh yeah, and he passed away, didn't he? No, he just went to space. Oh, thank God. No, no, no. He thank just God. went up. William Shatner just went into space. Oh, yeah, yeah. William he's Captain Shatner, Kirk. dude. I forget about that. I always think of, uh, he's, I knew him from Rescue 911. He's Captain James T. Kirk of yeah. the Starship Enterprise. Mr. Spock is dead. Yeah. You know, but Captain Kirk of the, we grew up to that in the yeah. 60s. That was the coolest show on TV was Star Trek. James T. Kirk. My wife had a crush on him oh, when damn. she was a young girl. Fuck she him, told me. Man. She said I was in love with and I, you know, and uh, Captain Kirk. Yeah. James T. Kirk. Of this, and no, I thought, and, and it was kind of interesting because I saw a, a, a huge scientist interviewed, mm-hmm. and they asked him how he felt about William Shatner being ch- going into space like that. He looked and smiled, and he, he said something really cool. He goes. William Shatner didn't go into space. He said James T. Kirk went into space. Oh, that's cool. A certain part of him. I no, me- I just thought that was so cool that this scientist said, William Shatner didn't go into yeah. space. James T. Kirk went into space. Yeah, I like that. A little bit of the mystique, keeping it yeah. alive. Yeah, he went into space. It's hard to keep so mystique now, alive. when you watch Star Trek, you know that man's been to space. Yeah. <laughs> And he came, do you hear his message? Uh-uh. Take care of our planet. Wow. He came back so, he said, and you know what I've heard? Everybody that goes up there comes back a total greenie. Mm. Stop the destruction of our planet because they're seeing out there nothing but drab dead. And they look back on this blue thing that shines with life. When you're out there, Damn. there ain't no life, or yeah, at least did. we ain't found it yet. Yeah, you know, and there is, but we ain't found it yet. Yeah, you know, you think but, they're out but there? But they said when you look, of course, read Neil's book lately. Read Neil's oh, I look, I, book. I'm just saying from just a layman's term. The universe term. is so large. Yeah. Oh, do you know what else is BS? I hope they all. You know what else is? BS? Here's what ticks <clears throat> me off now. You got this whole thing in schools where they don't want to teach the truth. Yeah. They don't want to teach the truth now. They want to gloss it over so the white people can feel good. Yeah. Right? It's ridiculous. Do you know what I learned now, too? We here. Okay. For years, we celebrate Columbus Day. Mm-hmm. He discovered America. And I ding myself in the head and go, it took me how long to realize, how can you discover something if there's already somebody there? Right. <laughs> you didn't discover nothing. There was already people there. But why did we used to have it that way? Then it was just an easy way to explain it. It's all we knew. No, it's because there was. They didn't have a flag. Oh, you gotta have a flag, man. You gotta buy. Eddie Izzard will tell you that. You know yeah, Eddie Izzard. Yeah. Watch Eddie. Eddie will explain it. You gotta have. You gotta a have flag. a flag, man. You gotta have a flag. <laughs> but no, you, you're getting back to it again. You, you, you know, uh, where, where are we going now? I'm getting old now. Uh, um. Well, we're talking about... Uh, Shit. <laughs> I don't know. We're happens, talking about a lot of different things. I wanted- well, the, the last thing I wanted to make the point. Oh, uh, the, the space. Is there people out there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, the, you, you look at the situation now, and, and I read the... Are there people out there? Oh, I know Columbus. So not only did Columbus not discover America, you know what else was total BS we got taught? What was it? That he, that he went there believing the earth was flat. Oh, that's a lie? That's a complete lie. Mm. Neil shows where they knew centuries before Columbus that the world wasn't flat. Damn, bro. But yet in all our school books, 
that's what we read. Oh, Columbus discovered America, and they sent him to find out because they were terrified he was going to fall off the end of the earth. It was flat. Oh, I remember our teacher even made a thing where he went up the side and then turned onto the corner. Get Neil's book. He lays it right out when we knew the world wasn't flat. And it happened literally probably 800 years before Columbus even sailed. They knew that that scholars knew the earth was not flat. Yeah. <laughs> I think sometimes... So why were we taught that bullshit? Okay, that's a good question. That's Probably what I want to know. Why, to make it you easy. You know what angered me? Here's what's got me in a roar about this and why I'm saying you teach it. It took me 69 years to learn that we massacred black people in Tulsa. Yeah. Well, I, guess I learned it- that last year. Why I you... was 69 years old when I learned that. Right. That is the first I have known of that in 69 years on this planet. Yeah. I got angry. Why wasn't I taught about that in school? Right. Why is that not written in a... Well, here's one for you. Did you know there was a coup d'etat attempt on President Roosevelt mm. by Wall Street? I no, believe it. Because it's been eradicated, raced, set aside. Major General Smedley Butler saved our country. Damn. The two time Congressional Medal of Honor winner. He was handpicked, chosen to be the president. Damn, young goat. But you know what Smedley did? Smedley went in front of Congress and ratted him. Mm. He whistle blew him. Smedley said, FDR's my president. I'm a Republican. He's a Democrat. He's a two time Congressional Medal of Honor Marine General. Smedley goes, he's still my president. Even though I'm in a different party, this is treason. Right. And he turned these guys over, all the Rothschild, all these names, these big names on Wall Street. They had handpicked Smedley Butler. Why? Because FDR was bringing in these socialist programs. What does Wall Street fear? Anything that's socialist. Mm. And we here in the U.S. fear everything socialist, don't we? Yet, here's one for you guys time to learn from Jesse. Our biggest part of our budget that you and I pay taxes on is for total socialism. Like you how? know what that is? Uh-uh. The Department of Defense. Defense. Yeah. They, that's total socialism at its finest. So you have socialism protecting the capitalism. Mm. Damn, and it's yet the dark people, arts. And yet people are telling you, oh, I'm scared. They're turning the country socialist. Right. Well... What you need, if you have all capitalism, you're going to fail. We right. saw that on Wall Street. I think we're the still seeing it now. Cheat. You have to have a balance. Yeah. You have to achieve a balance between capitalism and socialism that raises the most people up. Right. Well, That's to- when you have a great society. So all these people that fear socialism, you're very military. I was a Navy SEAL. Guess what? Other than sp- combat pay and special pay for things I did, my base pay for being a Navy SEAL was the same as the base pay of a cook. Wow. I don't get paid no more. If he's the same rank as me, it doesn't matter that I'm on SEAL team and he's over frying hamburgers. Now, I did make extra money because they give us hazardous duty pay for jump. But get this, you only get two of the three. I was qualified for all three hazardous and duties. You only get two or three? They only let you have two. Man. And guess what? Officers get paid twice as much. Now tell me that ain't socialism. Why yeah. does an officer get paid twice as much as me? He jumps out of the same, same plane. Yeah. You know, but he does. No, I, I would get $55 extra a month for jumping, <laughs> and I'd get $55 extra a month for demolition pay. I got paid nothing for diving. Wow. And diving's supposed to be an extra 85 a month. But they only allow us to get two of the three. That's crazy. Why? I don't know. Yeah. They make us do all three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know? that's crazy. But one of them I have to do for good old Uncle Sam. That's on the house. <laughs> that's, that's on that, the house. That's a charity one. I get to all the diving I do under the water. Yeah. That was for charity. Yeah. 
I got a, uh, <laughs> I got a couple questions that these are things that I think people need to hear and hearing it from you I think are very important. All right. Um, you talk a lot about how like the two party system, how it's one of the things that's definitely failing us, and you've been an example of being an independent, right? Yeah. What don't people understand about even just voting for an independent, whether you even almost believe in them or not? What can that do to change the current st system that we have? Like, well, well, really. Truly, truthfully, it's simplicity, I think, in voting. And, and if everyone would just stick to the simplicity of it, vote your conscience. Don't pick a winner. Your job when you vote isn't to go there to vote for the, who you think's going to win. Your job in voting is to go there and pick out the candidate whom you think would best represent your point of view. Yeah. And vote for that person. If that person gets beat, you did, still did your civic duty. You vote now. If you vote so for someone true, else, huh? you're selling out. Yeah. If you vote the two part, like if you find some third person who thinks way more like you and has better ideas that you go with, but yet you still vote, but well, he can't win. Well, one thing I proved is, yeah, if you get the most votes, you can win. Yeah. It just takes getting the most votes. Right. And, well, it was like when I ran. They told me this is back in '98. They told me. Forget the young people. They don't vote. Huh. I told them, book me at every college in the state of Minnesota. Yeah. And they said, you're wasting your time, the, the guys with the... I said, no, I ain't. Yeah, and I'll dominance. tell you why. They said, why? I said, because the college kids have never had Jesse the body to vote yeah. for. Are you kidding me? Yeah. So they booked me in all the colleges. I'd go there, packed to the hilt. Yeah. Kids hanging off the rafters. Yeah. You know when I knew I was going to win? And they were your age because you're talking 20 years ago. Wow. So this is your yeah. generation. Uh, here's when I knew I was going to win that day. We got there the morning of the election. And at the University of Minnesota, they said the lines to register were longer than the lines to vote. Because in Minnesota, we have same-day registration. Nice. And the lines to register were longer than the lines to vote. Wow. That's when I knew... We're going to win because they ain't coming out to vote for a Democrat or Republican. They're, yeah. they're already registered. These are new people. And it ended up, I won by, I was polling 10%. Mm -hmm. It was a, not a presidential, so they predicted a 50% voter turnout, non-presidential, which okay. is pathetic. Right. But it still leads the nation. Minnesota does every year. Really? Oh, yeah. Us in Maine, we battle it out for the most percentage to vote. Well, so people come. People here come out and vote. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And uh, and what happened was, they predicted a fifty percent voter turnout because it wasn't presidential, so a lot of people stay home. It ended up sixty. I was polling twenty seven percent the day before. I ended up winning with thirty seven because remember, there's three people now, so oh. the percentages change. I had thirty seven. The Republican had thirty four. The Dem ended up with twenty eight. Yeah, but. My 27 to 37 that was the 10% they didn't expect to show up. Yeah. Because they predicted a 50% voter turn. It turned out it was 60. And, though, and those 10 came voting for me. Well, I'll never forget the headline in the Minneapolis paper, Ventura wins. Sub-headline underneath, remember I told you about the colleges? Mm -hmm. Throngs of young voters turn yeah. out. Throngs. That was the term they used. It's like you sliding in the ring with a chair, dude. Well, at the end. it was like I went out and see as a th getting back to your original question, third party. That's what a, the all. That's what you've got to tap into to right. beat them. Right. You're not going to beat their bases. Right. You've got to get. And but most people are independent. We're be, You know what angers me right now the most of anything. Our country is being governed and stopped from doing anything by those 50 people in the Senate, the mm. 50 Republicans, mm. right? I don't know. Well, then they got to do that shit they call where you need 60 votes or whatever. What do you mean you don't know? You better start knowing. I'm trying to. That's anyway, why I'm talking to there's, you. Okay, 50 Republicans block everything, right? Okay. Here's what pisses me off. Because there's an equal amount of senators, two in each state. Yeah. Do you know those 50 Republicans, how much of the population they actually represent? And they're stopping the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. They represent 21% of the population. Wow. 
because you have states like North and South Dakota that have the same Senate, two people, as California, uh. as New York. So they have equal to them. They can stop them. That's insane. Now, it was initially, I know why it was done, so it was equality amongst the 13 original states. Right. But when California has a huge population and New York has a huge population, how can they be equal to South Dakota? But then do you worry that we're And by the way, I see more South Dakota license plates in Mexico than I see in South Dakota. (laughs) You know why that is? Uh -uh. Because South Dakota don't give a shit if you live there or not. You can just license your car there. So all these people from California that are supposed to bring them back for emission tests because they still have them there, you'd have to drive the whole Baja to do that every year. Mm. Well, they leave them down there and they just register them in South Dakota. Wow. So you see South Dakota plates all over the Baja. <laughs> like I said, there's more South Dakotans in the Baja than there is in South Dakota. <laughs> what? Um, you also, you talk a lot about... South um, Dakota just wants the money. Yeah, yeah, they real, don't give oh, a yeah. crap where you live. They'll license you. And that's great. Fine. No problem for me. Yeah. A you lot know? of places have different little loopholes like that. Sure. It's the way to make money. Um, what about... Um, you talk a lot... You, I've heard you speak about... Uh, about tax at the point of purchase, you know, which yeah, I've long been a proponent of. Tax. Yes, that that's the way we should do it. It would keep all these loopholes and all this bullshit. Everybody that spend pay money them. would pay their tax, and you'd live within your means, right? How do because we, can you explain you, that to people who don't well, understand what it Nash, is? When I really got into it, it was I think Representative Army from Texas, Dick Army, was his name. He brought I learned it. He brought it. I learned it when he brought it up. Mm -hmm. A national sales tax is like a state sales tax. What it would do, you could throw away all the records you have to keep for seven years of income. You wouldn't have to keep them. You would never be audited again. All of that would be gone. The tax at that time would have been 12%. Well, that would then keep our government on budget with the economy. They'd have to ensure the economy stays good. Otherwise, they don't get their money, do they? Right. But when they have an income tax, they get their money whether the economy's good or not. Uh, See? Mm -hmm. This way, they would be directly correlated with the economy. Now, it would be then, maybe it'd be a little more now, but 12% is a lot less than I'm paying now. Yeah. So you would pay that at the point of purchase. Now- Businesses are already doing that. So you as an individual would never have to keep a tax return again. You'd never have to file one. Less stress. Everything you do would be done at the point of purchase buying. Right. Now your car would cost, and it would make you more conscious of, what of living in your means because you'd, ha- you'd see a price on the car that you go, holy shit, it, it's up 12% because I have to pay a 12% sales tax to the federal government. Yeah. Well, guess who else would pay that? Tourists. Everybody. Right now, tourists don't pay t- federal tax here. Right. They would if you oh, had a national sales tax. If they're in your they state, they're paying it. And bought something, and right. there'd be a federal t- sales tax on everything. Yeah. And get this. You wouldn't have to put it on food. Right. And you wouldn't have to put it on clothing, say, under 100 bucks. Now, if you buy a mink stole or buy... Dripping with diamonds, yeah, you're going to pay. Right. But you could buy your underwear, your blue jeans, and your T-shirts. You ain't going to walk around naked, yeah. and you wouldn't have to pay tax. And I notice all of us are dressed that way today. Yeah. So we wouldn't have to pay no tax on none of the clothes any of us are wearing. I love that, man. How far – is that ever a possibility? They'll never do it. Yeah. They'll never do it because the rich people don't pay anyway. They pay lawyers instead, so they mad, don't have bro. to pay. And, and, uh, and, okay, then here's the other thing people said to me. Okay, what would you do with IRS then? They'd be gone, right? No. You turn their job around. Instead of the IRS watching us, the people, Mm -hmm. you make them watch the businesses and the government to ensure they're collecting and using our taxes correctly. The IRS then becomes our watchdog of the government and business. God, we need that. Yes. Why do you think it won't pass? Because Because it's it's good, it's common sense, (laughs) it makes sense. And if I can quote Charles Manson... No sense makes sense. Yeah. 
<laughs> That's a quote from Charles Manson. Is it really? Yeah. Yeah, dude. He said that one time. No He's sense makes sense. misunderstood a little bit. <laughs> no sense. Think about it. No, no sense, sense makes sense. sense. That's how they operate. Yeah. No sense makes sense. Yeah. You know? But no, a national sales tax. You couldn't cheat on it. Yeah. Because you'd pa- it, everything you bought and sold would have to require Right, you have to be able to pay for it, be, pay it right then. Roughly, let's just say 12, 15%. Let's yeah. go high, 15%. Well, I'm paying way more than 15% right now. Right. So at least, you know, yeah, I love I don't the part- pay nothing 15%. Yeah. Now, and then they said, oh, it'll hurt poor people worse because it's regressive. Yes, but you know, you can do with it what you want. You could find out, say, what a person's at in poverty. Right. So a person in poverty, say, if their income, they don't make that much money, you could give them their first $20,000 of purchases, no tax. You right. could give them a credit card. Right. That, But anything beyond that, if they start living beyond their means, then they get taxed. Yeah. But you, you could see the thing, you can make it anything you want it, and you can give breaks where you feel you need it to help poor people. Right. You know, you could give them their first twelve thousand in purchase, no tax. Yeah. You know, if you're under twenty five thousand in income. Yeah. You know, we'll give you your first half if you spend half yeah, of your help money. Yeah, we help you out. We help you out. You don't have to pay tax on nothing. Oh yeah. You know, you get you can survive. But then the big people that buy yachts and buy Mercedes hit and buy up. all that, hit them yeah. up. Yeah. Thick boy shoes or whatever they're yeah. buying. Yeah, hit you're them up. buying all that fancy crap. Well, you pay for it. <laughs> yeah, dude. You yeah. know, if that's your lifestyle, well, then, then live your lifestyle. Enjoy it. Yeah, and, and it would force people to live within their budgets. Yeah, force them to. They couldn't buy something. They'd have to say, "Jesus, I'm going to have to make more money to go if I want this." Yeah, you know, I can't afford this. I love that, man. Yeah, I feel like it's that's called the national that we need. sales tax. Yeah, and you abolish the income tax. Do any countries do it? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. But you think how nice. So I, I carry, I've got, I've got, I was cleaning out shit. I've got crap that goes back oh. 25 years in my attic, papers, shredding it. And I have to sit and spend entire afternoon shredding documents. Yeah. I feel like I'm in Watergate. Oh, yeah. It's you like, know, the uh, thing with Nixon. <laughs> you know, yeah. documents. It's like Fargo, kind of. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. It was just ridiculous on that. So, yeah, the national sales tax. I've advocated for that since 1990. No, people need to know. I just, I think you a lot know, of people don't even know that it's a possibility. Oh, well, it ain't a possibility because they're not going to do it. Right. You know, you, you, think- you would have to vote all them creeps out of office and get a whole bunch of new people in there. Mm-hmm. But the new generation could do that. Could do it. It's up to you guys. Come to us for the advice. Right. But it's going to be up to you guys to do it. To the practicality. Yeah. Now you I love guys some are of that information. Carry the ball. We're too old to carry the ball now. Yeah. We can be the coaches. We can be up in the press box. We can map the game out for you. But it's you 40 and unders, 50s and unders that got to pick that ball up and run with it. You got to play the game now. Do you believe that things can change? I believe that they can, but I don't. I, I, I'll tell you. Because you're very optimistic for even somebody in your, in your age, well, I find. Well, I shouldn't say that I am. Uh, th- it's the first time in my life that I don't see the United States with a better future in the future, mm. that I don't see as much light as I used to. I always would see light at the tunnel. Yeah. But right now, because because there's so much lying and there's so much deceit and people don't know what to believe and what not to believe. Yeah, that's the scariest part. And And our government causes it. Yeah. And they cause it by things that, like, how come John F. Kennedy, they still have documents on that? Right. It's 60 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and that, and I'll even say 9-11. Yeah. Because I have questions on both of those events, and nobody seems to be able to answer them adequately for me. And what troubles me about those, and maybe we'll finish with this to make people think on it, is if the stories they told us are true, right? Mm -hmm. In the case of Kennedy and in the case of 9-11, if those are the truth, what we were told, then why would anything have to be withheld because of national security? Yeah, the truth should be just the truth. What what national, if, if, okay, if Lee Oswald was a lone nut and did what they said he did, 
Why would any documents have to be held right. for national security? He was a he was a little private in the Marines. Yeah. He wasn't a general who had He's sensitive a goofball. Well, he was at a base where they U two flights and all he that. Or wife stuff. beaters too, I remember. But but then you look to nine eleven and you go, okay, here's what they told us to accept. Right. Now listen to this. This is what they told us. That nineteen Islamic radicals yeah, armed, what a term with, wait, too. armed with box cutters defeated our multi-billion dollar air defense system all while conspiring with a bearded guy in a cave in Afghanistan. Yeah. And we accepted that. Hook, line, and sinker. Now, I have a hard time accepting that for a couple reasons. First of all, we've then been screwed because if we've paid billions of dollars for... security Mm -hmm. and you can defeat it with box cutters yeah we got screwed out of our money second of all when i was governor of minnesota if we would have had a disaster at a state level that would have been equivalent to that Mm -hmm. and it could have been prevented don't you think somebody should get fired and yet on 9 11 Not one person lost their job. Not one person was even demoted over this gross derelict of duty protecting us and the whole thing. And in fact, nobody was demoted. The opposite occurred. People got promoted. How does that work? When I was in the Navy SEALs, we had a simple thing that failure was not an option. Yeah. And I would think air defense failure is not an option. Whoever was in charge of our air defense and allowed 18 Islamic radicals with box cutters to defeat it should have lost their job, shouldn't they? Yeah. Well, you know why they don't lose their jobs? That's how people start talking. That's how whistleblowers start. That's how information starts being developed. If you lost your job and nobody else did, you're going to be pissed. You're going to say, wait a minute, I did this, I did that, but so-and-so told me to do this. And all of a sudden you've got people turning over other people and pretty soon it leads to higher places. Yeah. Well, if you don't want that to happen, don't fire no one. Right. And ev- and bus- the day goes on as normal the next day. Everybody, Everyone's back to work. Everybody thinks they did everything fine. Yeah. Not even knowing they might have been yeah. a pawn in something. And they didn't get fired. Nobody yeah. got Don't you don't you guys think somebody should have got fired? Yeah. Oh, yeah, With now a that I think about it. like that that we invest billions of dollars in? Yeah, and we got beat air by defense. A damn- and they can go with box cutters and take three planes and smash them. <laughs> crazy now. Well, I, I'll, I'll leave well, you with. Why the, am I wait, such wait, an I'll Ill- leave you with this one. You all familiar with conspiracy theory? Yeah. My TV show. Or did I get in trouble doing? Oh, that I know Eddie maybe? Bravo, the guy. Yeah. You know. Well, I spoke to a woman, Sergeant April Gallup. Uh, top secret crypto security clearance. Mm-hmm. She was in the room that the alleged plane hit the Pentagon, right? Mm -hmm. She looked me right in the eye and told me there was no plane. What? Well, did you ever see one? No. No. All you saw was a hole, and then they covered it up with a tarp. There was no wings. There was no debris on the lawn outside. There was no place where the wings hit the building to sever them. Jeep. If all you saw was this big hole yeah. that they covered up, she looked at me. She said there was no plane. She said there was no luggage. There was no seats. There were no bodies. She staggered out the hole and was recovered on the lawn. Mm-hmm. And the government immediately put her into seventy-two hour solitary confinement where no she couldn't way. talk to nobody. Uh, yeah, and she told me there was no plane. She said she thought she did it. Because she said, I was at work. I went in that day. She said, I was working on my computer. And she said, right when I'd hit this particular button, the whole room blew up. And her initial thought was her computer was wired to a bomb. Wow. But she doesn't believe that now, you know, that it was. Right. But that's what happened. And she said, through all, there was no plane. What does she believe now? She don't. She won't. She will just tell you there was no plane. Right. 
which is all she knows. She doesn't know what did it. She doesn't know how it was done. She just is clear that there was not a plane. And when you look at the thing, if they superimpose the plane with the hole, mm-hmm. it w- the engines would have dug big trenches through the dirt before it struck because the engines are lower than the hole. Right. And they would have been down in the dirt digging a trench. There were no trenches out there. Plus, those planes have components out of carbon titanium steel, which is the hardest substance known to man. When it hits cement, the cement breaks. The carbon titanium steel don't. Where's the debris? Yeah. Yeah, you never even heard about it. Well, who can and we these trust? The then? Only Jesse, who planes. can we trust? Wait, here's another one for you. These are the only planes that have ever gone down where they never tried to put them with the pieces back, resurrect them oh, back together yeah. again. Even though they should have had plenty of pieces. Yeah. Never was an attempt even done. To put that where they always do that in a plane crash. Oh, it's the big thing they do. That's the huge thing they do. Lo and behold, in this day, 9 11, that wasn't done. Well, and who I'll do we finish, trust? wait, who I'll finish trust, with Jesse? the final one that I need an answer to. Here's the final one. Prior to 9 11, yeah. base commanders had the ability to scramble jets. In other words, if they got a call from the FAA that something was wrong up in the air, a base commander could order and scramble jets. Happened all the time. And what does that mean when they scramble a jet? Up go jets to find out what's going on. Okay. Fighters. Okay, so so they could send in jets. Top gun. Gang. That'll put you in, okay, they're sending fighter jets up. Tom Cruise oh, yeah, is Goose. going airborne. Goose daddy. Just so you'll understand. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, base commanders had the ability to do that. Okay. Correct? Yes. Till June of 2001. In June of 2001, there was an executive order that the only person that could scramble planes was Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense. Mm. Had to come from Donnie. That happened in June. 9-11 happens. Interesting. They couldn't find Rummy for hours. Rummy was unavailable. Unbelievable. So no planes could go into the air. 9-11 happens. One month later, guess what? The policy's put back to the old of June Damn. 1st. Now the base commanders can scramble planes again. But for that three-month period in there, they weren't allowed to. I'd like an answer to that question and yeah. why an executive order went out to did that. Yeah. And that why was it reinstated after 9-11 took place? And who, who, who can we trust then? Who can we trust? I don't know. You got to trust yourself. Yeah. You got to do your own work. Yeah. You know, you got to. And, and, and let me add this. Everything I did on conspiracy theory, I didn't necessarily believe it in all of it. Got to remember, this is entertainment. This is a TV show, right? You know, like I, they, everyone's getting on me now because my show predicted the pandemic, right? Really? Yeah. This uh, woman from South America, I had her on. She was with that general, that with the, uh, the all that crazy stuff. What the Petraeus? hell is his name? No, the people that talk to goats. Oh, uh, General, uh, f- I forget his name. Fo now. Young. It's not real Fo Young, name. huh? It's not the Vietnamese guy. No, 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 no. He's got this real long name. He's like a he's like a, a mystique person within the U.S. military. Oh, dang! I don't you even know? know. Well, he came up here with his wife, who's a doctor. I had a, interviewed them in a hangar on I forget what subject it was, and she told me there's going to be a pandemic. Damn. Within the next six years, and sure enough, there was, and that's why everyone's yelling at me that I'm a turncoat now because I got vaccinated. Yeah. How does that make me a turncoat? Yeah. You know, I, I I look at it from I look at it from the odds, and when it's ten to one, you're going to die unless you get a vaccination. I'm going with the good odds. I'm not going to test the bad ones. I'm seventy years old now. Yeah, it's I want to stay years here old. as long as yeah. I can. Yeah, we you need know? you here. And and you know, I'm not going to. I'm going to get my booster coming up here. No problem. And people said and they hadn't bothered me. You yeah. know, the only thing that bothered me at getting the shots. Mm. 
my deltoid got sore. Yeah. Well, guess what? When they stick a piece of metal in rock solid ripped Let's muscle, go. you know, it gets sore. Yeah. By the way, you know what's been good for me in the pandemic? Mm. Working out. Yeah. I'm two twenty. I'm Let's in the bed. Go. I got I got six pack. At have- seventy years old, <laughs> I got a six go. pack. How many people can say at 70 they got a six-pack, baby? Not a lot of yeah, people. Not, why? Because yeah. there's nothing else to do. Yeah. Now, you know I've been banned from The Price is Right. Have you? No, really? Oh, yeah, because I watch it while I work out every day. I know the price of every car on there, baby. <laughs> I want to see you get <laughs> no, through. No, I watch Drew Carey. He's one of my favorites. Oh, I watch, he's great. I train to The Price is Right. Yeah. That, that is on every morning that I train, whether I'm on the elliptic or doing my weights. Drew Carey and The Price is Right, and then Andy and Mayberry. Oh, yeah, he's yeah. good. You know, I went to the I'm hometown. I'm buying my wife a T-shirt. Are you? She, oh, she hates Barney Fife. Oh, really? Yeah, she hates him. I, I, so I'm getting her a T-shirt, I hate Barney Fife. There <laughs> <Okay>, you <laughs> go. He's from North Carolina. Did you? Did South you, Carolina. Oh, he's from South Carolina? Yeah, that's Mayberry, South Carolina. They ain't North Carolina. There's a sta- No, the, the guy is actually from whoever played Andy Griffith. Oh, maybe he is, but Mayberry itself was supposedly in South Carolina. Oh, yeah, there's a statue it's of Mayberry, him. South Carolina. In, uh, the By the way, you heard that uh, they took down Robert E. Lee's uh, statue, right, in Virginia? Oh, yeah. Finally? Yeah. Yeah, did you hear what Trump said? Uh-uh. Donald, with his vast military knowledge and experience, <laughs> you know, I, I give him a lot of credit and credibility. Here's a Trump come out. You didn't hear what he said? Uh-uh. Oh, he come out and said that... Lee was a great general, and had we had him, we'd have won in Afghanistan. <laughs> he said this. You guys are laughing. He said this. But he could. He now, my first question was. Could have been true. We must really be getting bad history because, if I recollect right, didn't Lee lose yeah. in the Civil yeah. War? So shouldn't we have sent Ulysses Grant yeah. over to Afghanistan? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. He's the guy that won, you know. Robert E. Lee lost. <laughs> yeah, sometimes we don't even think yeah, about I mean, that. Why would Trump want to send a guy who lost? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that man thought a lot before. He, I don't think Trump was a big thinker. Why do you think so many people gravitated towards Trump? Because I know a lot of people I don't that know. love Trump, and they're not all dummies. They're not all idiots. Know. A lot of them are good people. I don't know. I'm trying to figure out if it's fluoride in the water. Because I've never had fluoride in my water. Do you think he just sounded you, like? Do you know what that is? Fluoride, fluoride in the water? No, I think we had well, it when I was. They put fluoride kid. in all water. Uh uh-uh. uh Sure they do for your teeth, so you don't get cavities. Fluoride goes into all drinking water. Oh, I got cavities. Well, do you know what fluoride's the major ingredient of? Uh uh-uh. uh <laughs> I've never because all the homes, and it wasn't by design, but every house I've lived in, I've had my own well. Yeah. And I, you can send it to University of Minnesota, and the kids in chemistry will test your water free. Wow. Or at minimal price. Yeah. You know, because they got to have things to do. They're yeah. in chemistry class. Other children, yeah. So they'll, you know, they'll break down your water. You can do it at the university. Send it over there, and they'll give you a whole breakdown of what's in your well water. Wow. Well, uh, the, uh, the thing is, I've had well water my whole life. I've never been hooked up to city water in mm-hmm. none of the houses. And city water, like the city of Brainerd, where Fargo was from, they got mm-hmm. in a big fight years ago. They didn't want to fluoridate their water. Mm-hmm. The feds came in and made them. Wow. Didn't even get the option. Well, here's the deal. You know what fluoride's the major ingredient of? Mm. Prozac. Oh, damn. So if you're drinking fluorinated water on a daily basis, you're getting a daily supply of Prozac. Because that's the major ingredient in Prozac. What's Prozac for? To calm you down, right? Yeah. Take away anxiety, I guess. I never used it. Take away it. your ideas, I think. Maybe at that a too. Certain point. Dumb you down. Oh, it really sedates your brain after a while. Yeah. I've and if you're drinking it. fluoridated water every day, fluoride's the major ingredient in Prozac. Fuck. <laughs> Fuck, Jesse. Well, maybe it ain't what does Prozac do. Yeah, I don't know that. I'm not a chemist. Yeah. All I can tell you is it's the major ingredient of Prozac is fluoride. I'm not shocked. <laughs> Everything's scary now. Well, it was scary then, too. Was it always scary? Sure. We had the draft. You think it's day. just new scaries well, now? Well, we had the draft. I grew up in South Minneapolis, right? Yeah. If you grew up in South Minneapolis and you had to go to work for a living because your parents weren't rich, guess what? You were going to Vietnam. Right. If you grew up out in Edina, Minnetonka, with the fat cats, where Al Franken grew up. Oh yeah, that oh yeah. Thick yeah well, bitch. then you went. Then you went to uh, Harvard. Oh, you, you were to, fine. You went to Blake Indiana School. Indiana University. No, you went to Blake School here in Minneapolis. That's yeah. an elite Art. 
money Art school, college, you know. Yeah. Well, those kids didn't worry about Vietnam. They went to college and got deferments and got out of it. Remember Dick Cheney got like six deferments out of Vietnam. And they asked him, and Dick's response was, well, I had other priorities. I heard that and said, well, so did every other kid that got drafted. Why do you think they got drafted, for Christ's sake? Yeah. They had other priorities. Yeah. You know, me, I was <laughs> yeah. a dummy. I went and enlisted. Did you know the Navy's never drafted? Oh, really? Nope. So only the Army's drafted? Army and the Marines and all that. Wow. A lot of people, when there was the draft, a lot of people would join the Navy. Because with the Navy, you're at least guaranteed three hots and a cot. Oh, yeah? You know, you're going to get a bed and you're going to get three hot meals a day. You're not going to be laying in the dirt. Yeah. But then you can do what I did and go into volunteer for what they call the Brownwater Navy. Mm -hmm. And then you probably, well, we had it better than the Army, though, in the end. Because all of our operations were one-nighters. We don't go out. But the Marines are those hitmen. The Marines come in and they're the hitmen. No, we are. I mean, the You've got to understand are... something. I don't. There's a, there's a, the Marines claim they're first ashore, yeah. right? They're not. Want me to sing you? I'll end you with a song. Okay. That'll piss off all the Marines. Because <laughs> we, we used to piss them off anyway. <laughs> hey, let's keep they it going. They never liked us you, frogmen seals to begin with. <laughs> let's keep it going. Here's, here's, a, here's a song we used to sing in, tra in UDT SEAL training. Okay. And it's entitled Marines Drowning in the Waves. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Now, you know that UDT stands for Underwater Demolition, Demolition Team. Team. Okay. Okay. And, we're, and BUDS is called Basic Underwater Demolition Slash Seal. Okay. You know, because the SEALs came about in 62 mm -hmm. when Kennedy took the frogmen out of the water and put them on land. Wow. And so they needed a name. Like and they mermaid. came up with Sea Air Land. Because we'll come from the sea, we'll come from the air, or we'll come from the land. Let's get them. Sea Air Land. That's what SEAL stands for. And this is a song we would sing in training called Marines Drowning in the Waves. It goes, Marines drowning in the waves. It's UDT who always saves. And when a job they cannot do, it's UDT who pulls it through. <laughs> Although they claim they're first ashore, UDT's been there before. Oh, leathernecks on bended knees can kiss the ass of UDT's. <laughs> there you go. Now, <laughs> here's the tradition. We came about because in World War II, you know those landing boats with the Marines that flop the front down and the Marines oh, yeah. charge off on the yeah. beach? Well, they did one of them, and there was a sandbar. And when the boats went down, they hit the sandbar. When they dropped their front, I forget, hundreds of Marines ran off and drowned because they ran into deep water. Nobody knew the sandbar was there. Oh. So they needed to form the underwater demolition teams. Now... The blowing up came from obstacles the enemy would put in the water to stop those. We would blow them up. Okay. But we also would recon the beach to show where the boats could go in so they wouldn't hit a sandbar and potentially kill these brave Marines that are charging the beach. And don't get me wrong, they, I wouldn't do it. They're brave as hell. Yeah. I'll go in before them any day. Yeah. I don't want to be charging with them. Yeah. You know? I'll go in in the dark like yeah, I'll we go do. In different prep work. <laughs> we go yeah, in in the yeah, dark. Yeah, yeah. But what became a tradition, especially in the Pacific, was that when the Marines were going to land, the UDT watched the Frogmen, the yeah, movie with it. Richard I Widmark. Seen it. When the UDT would do the reconnaissance, at some point during the reconnaissance, one one or two Frogmen with a pre-made sign they carried with them would skin up onto the beach to the high water mark. Mm -hmm. They'd pound the sign in before they left in the dark. In the morning when the Marines would hit, there would be a sign on the beach, Welcome U.S. Marine Corps, UDT, whatever team it was. Wow. So we would welcome the Marines to the Say beach. Say we got there first. 
That was where they knew we were welcoming them. So when the Marines claim their first ashore, (laughs) eh, we've been there before. Now, granted, we don't stay. Yeah. We get in and (laughs) get out. Yeah. But we make sure it's okay for them to charge the next day. I see. So, and I have all the respect in the world for the Oh, Marines. 100%. It sounds you like know, it. It's just... In fact, I'll tell you this. Some things I would do, we'd get either helicopters. We did a lot of things with helos. Yeah. And we'd either get Navy pilots or Marine pilots. Uh-huh. I would always inquire, who's flying us? And when they'd say Marines, I'd always go, good. Yeah. Because I knew that if anything went out of whack... And you called that Marine, he's coming. Wow. He's a Marine. He's going to come. There's something special. He's huh? not going to think. He's not going to have second thoughts. He's going to charge the beach. He's wow. a Marine. So I always felt better when I knew Marine pilots were flying us. Yeah. We got a couple of jarheads up there flying us today. That's okay. That's good stuff. <laughs> but uh, no, Man. it's a natural rival. We were. No, I love it. We were at Camp Pendleton once. And what I used to hate about it was they used to send us up there when the Marines had practiced their landings. So we'd have to sit up all day in these boats if any of them fell in the water to pull them out. Yeah. You know, we're lifeguards. Right. And we'd think, what the hell? Where's Marine Recon? How come they don't do this shit? (laughs) What do we got to come up here and do this all day out in the sun, (laughs) bobbing around while they're landing on the beach, you know? And, uh, well, the one time we went up to Pendleton, we had Master Chief Corey came up with us, mm-hmm. E-9, our Command Master Chief. Okay, that's the highest you can get, E-9? Yeah, enlisted. Yeah. He's the, you had enlisted, right? Well, Marines don't always know uniforms very good. You know, charging the beach don't require you to know a lot of other stuff. Right. And, uh, so uh, an E-9 in the Navy on his lapel carries an anchor with two stars on the anchor. The anchor signifies a chief, okay. and the two little stars indicate a senior chief or a master chief, okay. E-9. Okay. Well, Corey's walking on the beach with his master chief, two stars, and all of a sudden these Marines are running on the beach and shit. They're stopping, boy, and they're popping salutes to Corey every yeah. going by, right? Well, Corey's an enlisted man. He's E-9. Well, then it hit us. They think Corey's a two-star admiral. All they're doing is seeing the two stars up on the lapel, and the Marines don't know Navy insignias. They think Corey's a... T- and word spread through the means, oh, boy, the frogmen got a two-star admiral with them. <laughs> Holy crap. Right on the beach with them. They got some two-star Navy admiral with them. You know, so we got anything we wanted. <laughs> hey, we need some stuff. Oh, yeah, let's get yeah, this over I need here. a crab leg up here at the front. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'll say this, and I'll, you know, I, I, I was in the Naval Amphibious Base Coronado, and that one best chow hall. It's beautiful the, over there. In the Western Pacific for like nine or ten years in a row. Mm. You know, we, you know, that shows you the superiority between the Navy and the rest of the services. Every Friday at the Naval Amphib Base Coronado, do you know what we had for lunch? Mm-mm. Every Friday, without fail. Frog. Steak and lobster, baby. Damn. They'd cover your beautiful piece of steak with a lobster tail. God. Y'all deserve it. And you know what it used to cost me for that? Because I, I, our job takes us away from the base. So we have to pay to eat on the base. We get what's called comrades in case we got to eat in town or somewhere. Yeah. Where you know, so we get paid. So I got to pay on the base. You know what the steak and lobster would cost me like eighty five cents. Damn, that's a deal, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Breakfast was like thirty five cents. Anything you wanted to eat. Damn. Went to army jump school. Oh, my God. If they didn't have the pizza trucks that ran around at night, I'd have starved to death. There. Really? Oh, Nothing the Army's eat. horrifying. Oh. Army jump school. They measure out, and you get one scoop of everything. Oh. You look at it, and you go, oh, we got out there to SEALs, and we're complaining to the Army going, how are you supposed to fight if you're not being fed? <laughs> Cripe almighty. We need food. We work out. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah. we burn energy. Feed us. So they made us do KP one time, and boy, we said, what is this bullshit? We said if the Green Berets came to our base, we wouldn't make them do KP. And you had to do it? Well, we're in Army Airborne School, part of the school. 
you know, which is a joke. I just completed 26 weeks of SEAL training, and I go out for three weeks of jump school. Yeah. <laughs> we used to get up at 5 in the morning and do PT before they'd even get up on wow. purpose to wake them all up. Damn. We'd be out there doing PT. The SEALs are out at 5 a.m. doing PT because they don't get enough from us. Damn. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's all part of the mystique, baby, the mystique. Back then, it was fun, they huh? didn't know us at all. Wow. In fact, we sent tremors through the rest of the Navy. Oh. It was all secretive, huh? Well, final story. I went to boot camp, and all that's right. where you go to boot camp. When you go to Navy boot camp, it's not difficult. Right. There's nothing hard there. In fact, I used to work out and do push-ups at night because I was getting out of shape. Damn. So I'm at boot camp. Damn. Well, one day, every day at boot camp, you get taught a different facet of the Navy. Okay. Electronics technician, storekeeper, boatswain's mate. Sonar tech, whatever, all these different jobs Clothing. in the Navy. Well, the one day you get the UDT SEAL presentation. Yeah. They march three companies into a room. So there's probably close to 100 guys in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, close to 100 guys in there. And you're giving the presentation or you're getting no, it? No, we're getting it. Okay. They march in, you're in boot camp. And they march you into a room and all of a sudden these guys come walking out wearing marine green, spit shine, Cochrane jump boots. They don't look Navy, and they're all built. Damn. And the guy walks up, Chief Razcheck, and goes, today, gentlemen, you're going to hear about the Brownwater Navy, the UDT SEAL. We are the Navy Special Forces. You volunteer to be one of us. Damn. You can't just be one of us. You have to pass our test mm. to be one of us. So then they show you, showed us a film called The Men with Green Faces. And you watch this film, right? And it tells you all about the SEALs, right? And then when you're done with that, he comes back out and he says, okay, anybody that wants to volunteer for the UDT SEAL program, stay seated. He goes, the rest of you, get the fuck out of here. Damn. There were guys running over each other getting to the doors. Yeah. Because, I mean, half of them joined the Navy. They didn't want to be doing this shit. <laughs> yeah. You know what they watched on a film. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Going behind enemy lines, six guys, <laughs> you know, all this stuff. They didn't want that smoke, there's huh? no, There's no friendlies anywhere. Wow. <laughs> that type of work. Uh -uh, I'd rather be on the ship. <laughs> but you wanted it. Oh, you have to have your volunteer. Yeah. Okay, probably I would say... Let me think back. 30 guys maybe stayed, 25, to take this, what they call the screen test. Mm -hmm. I would say a dozen of us were serious. The other 12 or whatever were just doing it to break the monotony of boot camp. Yeah. And so they, they march you over to the swimming pool, and you got to line up across the pool, and you got to do a 300-meter swim, long course, 50-meter pool, using only an underwater recovery stroke. You can't swim crawl. You can't swim butterfly or backstroke. Mm. You have to swim either breaststroke or side stroke, something that doesn't bring your arms out of the water because you're going to be doing clandestine swimming. So you can't breathe out of the water? No, you can breathe. You can't bring your arms oh, out. Oh, you got to be You don't want to be splashing. You want to underwater. Breaststroke is an underwater recovery stroke. Like hot and go seek or something. All they see is your head. Oh. If you're swimming the butterfly, you you're splashing and you look like you a butterfly coming in on the beach. Yeah. That brings attention. Yeah. So you can only do this swim using an underwater recovery stroke, 300 meters. Well, I was a competitive swimmer. So this was a piece of cake for me. And like a dummy, I do it like I'm in the Olympic trials and I win by like a pool length. Oh, you're I'm going to show these SEAL instructors. Boom, I hit the... I'm doing breaststroke like I'm in... Boom, 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 yeah. The turn, the pull underwater, the kick. doing kid. it all, dude. Yeah. You know, and doing I'm down and dolphin. back. The six, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> the next yeah. guy's still got 50 yards, eggs 50 meters to go, right? Yeah. But I was stupid. I wore myself out. I could have cruised. Because oh. when I later learned, because I used to give screen tests later, when I learned the time you had to beat, I could have cruised. <laughs> I didn't need to go that fast. <laughs> then I would say half of them were gone. At the end of the swim, mm -hmm. it eliminated half. We're now down to, I think, eight guys. Wow. They paired us up, and you had to do as many push-ups as you could in two minutes, only resting in the up position. Mm. And then the other guy went, and you counted for each other. Then as many sit-ups as you could do in two minutes, 
and then as many four count burpees as you could do in two minutes. Damn. Then they took you over to the to the track, and you then had to run a mile. And again, they don't tell you what's passing. They just say four times around the track, run the mile. Do you remember how quick you went? I don't know. Yeah. They didn't have a clock. I don't know. They didn't tell you. I, ca- I, I won the swim. I did great on everything else. I came in third on the run. Mm. Brettlinger and Bueller. I even know the two guys. Brettlinger and Bueller beat me yeah, on the run. Him. So we finished the run. They then line up the eight or ten guys, whoever was left up, and they walk down the line with a clipboard, and all he says to you is either pass or fail. Damn. Four, you know how many pass? Four. Oh. So you had 100 guys and only four guys passed. That was just to get to training. Damn. Then when you get to training, each class starts with about 100 guys roughly. Mm-hmm. You will probably graduate 25. Wow. It's got a 75 to 80% attrition rate. And that's all for UDT? Seals, both. Oh, that's for Seals for both. It's all. You're all one. Oh, there wow. Ain't no, there ain't no difference. Oh, okay. There's no difference There's no the difference. It's the oh. same training. Same training. In my day, you then went to a UDT team or a SEAL team. Wow. And they generally sent the better swimmers went to a UDT team. Damn. Because you were going to do more water work than a SEAL would. Wow. So I got sent to a UDT team because I was a good swimmer. Yeah. And I think back and all the guys from my class that went with, they were all the best swimmers in the class. Damn. And the instructor told me later, yeah, I said, oh, yeah, the best swimmers went to the UDT. The, the others went to the SEALs. The stronger swimmers always went to UDT. And, but you still carried weapons. You still did. In fact, lots of times we were the demolition element with the SEALs. Mm. They'd come and get one of us to go with to set yeah. up the explosives for them. You know, That's and, cool. And all that. No, it ain't cool. None of it's cool. Oh, it isn't? Nope, none of it. Today, my view today is I'm so anti-war. Really? Yep. But at the time, you had a different perception. Had though. to. Yeah. Had to. But today, it's all. F- Tell well, me one war we've been in since World War II. Oh, ac- I agree. Wait, that accomplished something. Yeah. Tell me one. Ain't any. Tell me one that accomplished something. Yeah. None. Yeah. Why were they fought? I don't know. I'll finish with this. My father had, my mother and father are both World War II veterans. Yeah. My mom was a nurse in North Africa. That predated Normandy. Wow. Not many can say their mom. And my mom was actually injured and sent back home Jeepers. in North Africa as a nurse. And my dad was under Patton, had six bronze battle stars, North Africa, Normandy, Battle of the Bulge, Remagen Bridge, Anzio, and Berlin, and lived. Jeepers. Jesus. Right? Those are my parents. Now you kind of understand but they weren't warmongers. They were nothing like that. But now you kind of understand why I went in the service. Yeah. Everyone in my family went in the service. It was kind of just what you did. And my parents never pushed us. In fact, my dad, I came home from high school, and my dad was home. World War II vet, six bronze battle stars. And I come home and told my dad, Dad, we got a fight in Vietnam. My dad goes, why? Why do you think that? I said, we have to stop the domino effect of communism. If we don't stop them there, it, the communism's going to go all over the world. This is what I, and yeah, up, that's ba, what they ba, thought. Ba, 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 India, ba, ba, everywhere. Right? You know what my dad did? He looked at me and he said, is that what they're teaching you in school? I said, yeah. My dad looked at me and said, that's the biggest bunch of bullshit I've ever heard. Wow. Now imagine what I went through right there. My father's telling me my teachers are bullshitting me. I respected my teachers. They, 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 and here's my dad telling me they're giving me a line of bullshit. My dad looked at me and said, we're not there to stop communism. He said, we're there because somebody's making big money. Mm. Well, when I, I was fortunate to come home, and I was fortunate that my second deployment, they had pulled us out. You know, I was at the very tail end, Feb, uh, February 71 till November 71. And uh, I was able to come home to my dad and say, guess what, dad, you were right. Mm. And my dad looked at me and said, well, I always knew I was right. I said, it's sometimes you just have to learn things the hard way. He said, I tried to, I did what I felt I had to do to tell you the truth. The rest was up to you. Wow. 
But, I mean, my dad was against the Vietnam War before the hippies. Damn. And here's a six. So you'll find that many veterans like myself are the most anti-war people. Wow. Because they know it doesn't accomplish nothing. And my dad fought in the popular war. Jesus. The one that was the great war. Yeah. You know, the one that stopped Hitler. Yeah. I might add, too, anyone that studies Hitler in 30s Germany... Take a look at Donald Trump. Yeah. Same playbook. Same playbook as Hitler's Germany. And he's doing it right now. Yeah. And this country's so stupid, they're falling for it. The guy's a con man and a good one because he's got a lot of smart people that have bought, drank the Kool-Aid for lack of better. He's Jim Jones. You know? They're all, do you feel like all the, all, so many politicians are con men though, huh? He's not a politician. Right. That's a good point. That's a good and point. And uh, also, too, you know how The Rock has said he might run and all yeah. this? What, these, what people need to understand is this. Yes, Jesse Ventura won. But they need to understand Jesse Ventura has done 14 years of public service. Right. Donald Trump had done none. Yeah. The Rock, to my knowledge, I love The Rock, but he's done none. Right. I was in the military six years, so I understand that part, mm-hmm. right? Right. That's public service. Right. You were a mayor. I was a mayor of the sixth largest city for four years, and I was a governor for four years. So I've every branch of government, so I have experience in the public sector. Yeah. These guys don't, and here's the big difference, and I'll end with this. The difference is this. The private sector is for profit. The public sector is to provide services. Mm. There's a big difference. These guys that come from the private sector bring only expertise at making profit. They don't bring Uh. the expertise at providing public service. Yeah. Government is public service. It's to provide for the masses. Yeah. The good of the many. Not the good of the few and not the good of the elite or the rich. It's to the masses. These guys have no, Donald Trump had no experience. Especially not, I don't of, think, helping, of helping, helping anyone people. but himself. I would agree with that. You know, and that's how come he came in and governed the same way. Yeah. And why people think he's the Messiah. I've had people, you know, I'm agnostic atheist, right? I've had people tell me Donald Trump is a good Christian. (laughs) You know what I responded with? Well, if he's a good Christian, I'm glad I'm not. (laughs) You You know, if that's what a good Christian is. (laughs) You don't want any part of it. I don't want no part of it. You don't want no part of it. Because he'd sell his soul to rock and roll, baby. He'll sell out. out. Look Look at what he's done to all the people around him. If you don't kowtow to him, he sells you out on the river, man. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's uh, so many of those guys, it's the dark arts, man. I just wonder, how do we get out of the system? How do we break this? This Don't vote for Democrats and Republicans. Yeah, agree. It's, it's as simple as the nose on your face, yep. but it's as difficult as climbing Mount Everest. Yeah, yeah. You know, nah. and especially, let me throw this out, especially, here's one that goes beyond my belief. When you have a state like, like I said, the Taliban's in Texas now. I call Texas the home of the Taliban, the United States Taliban. Mm -hmm. Because do you know right now it's easier to buy a gun in Texas than vote? Man. Now, isn't there something inherently wrong with that? Yeah. You can buy a gun in Texas easier than you can vote. Jeepers. (laughs) Nobody's going to ID you. For yeah, the gun. Yeah, 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 you can yeah. walk in anywhere in Texas and buy a gun. But yeah. if you got to vote, yeah. oh, you got to register, <laughs> jump through yeah. hoops. They've closed voting places. You maybe have to drive 30 miles. Yeah. Can't mail nothing in anymore. You know, none of that. We will have, And do you know there's no voter fraud? Uh-uh. I can tell you. I knew that. When I got into office in Minnesota, mm-hmm. we did a huge study. And it came back nothing significant. Yeah. And all the things they've caught now, the only votes they've caught have been votes for Trump that were illegal. Yeah. You know? It's a lot of- they, they, Who 
Here's the part that makes me laugh. Who do they think is out organizing voter fraud? Yeah. And for what purpose? <laughs> you got local people that volunteer their good time to be independent and count these votes like great American citizens, and then you got the Trumpies telling them they're all a bunch of crooks. Yeah. How dare these Trumpies say that? Well, I think they have no proof. I think there's there no, is none. I think there's no way to, de- to determine if those people counting the votes what their allegiances are. Both though. are there, right? Both are represented. They're, oh, well, if they're that's not the truth, done then, behind closed doors. Yeah, then that's totally that makes. And they had that phony recount in Arizona. Yeah. Biden won. Yeah. Even when they hired their hired <laughs> guns to come in and hopefully switch it over so they'd have an argument. Yeah, none of that amounted to anything. Didn't am- well, 60 court cases all thrown out. Yeah. Rudy Giuliani getting disbarred in some yeah. states now <laughs> because he brought these lawsuits or brought things to court with no evidence, yeah. which they do have rules, you know. Yeah. As a lawyer, you can't just bring frivolous things forward. You got to have evidence. Yeah. They had no evidence of nothing. Yeah, and yet people have bought into it and said it happened. I yeah, don't get a lot it. Of that is interesting. I don't know. It's funny to know how how involved people are, where people, what people are trusting. Have, these have days. any of you ever met anyone that committed voter fraud? You know, all your years on the planet, ever talked to anyone about doing it? <laughs> I never. Have. No, it's I've only done come almost to, every crime. There, I've we never got done four it. people in the room, and it's only come to light in the last <laughs> year or two. Voter fraud. That's a good point. No, nobody cared. You know, there no nobody. <laughs> any other election, and and Trump gave us a preview because remember, all leading up to the election, he was he was setting himself up if he lost. Yeah. Oh, if I lose, it's because it's rigged. Yeah. Remember, he started that early on out. I'll tell you, the person that knows him, forward and backwards, is that niece of his. Have you seen her? Oh, is she a real dime? Oh. Is that Ivanka? No, she, no, no, his niece. One of them is fine as she's hell. a Trump. She she's a psychologist, legit. Oh, is she went to college. She gets on TV and dissects his brain. Everything she said about him is exactly what happens. That's interesting. She said he will never admit losing the election, no matter what. Yeah, that's a lot of his thing never, is no admission never of never will admit it. Of a defeat. And then he's got all these people out there that are buying the Kool-Aid. Like, yeah. this guy's a hero? Come on. I don't on. know. I think different people Vietnam like him veteran. for different reasons. This guy ran from the draft. Yeah. He bought his... Re- now, I look up to Muhammad Ali, and Muhammad Ali ran from the draft. You know what the difference is, though? You know what the difference is? Mm-mm. Ali was willing to go to jail for his beliefs. Mm. Trump wasn't. Trump bought his way out. Trump faced no charges. Yeah. Trump buck, you know. That's rich people, system, man. Rigged the system. That's rich people. But see, see Ali, and Ali had it made. They already told him you're going to do nothing but what Joe Lewis did. You'll go down. You'll do exhibitions. Did it, did it. Ali wasn't going to get. He knew they were going to use him to get black kids to volunteer to send to Vietnam, wow. and he was going to have none of it. <clears throat> Mohammed was not going to be the catalyst that sent his. Black kids, you know, people have asked me if I've ever used the N word. Yeah. And I have to admit I have. Yeah, I I've used, used it. No, I used it when I quote Ali. Oh, wow. I quote Muhammad Ali, and he used it. So if he can use it, yeah. I can quote him. Yeah, yeah. That's and not, fair. And, and he said it about the Viet Cong. Remember, he said, no, Viet Cong never called me the N word. Oh, wow. No, no. I remember when Mohammed said that to the press. Ain't no Viet Cong. What do I want to fight these people for? Ain't no Viet Cong ever called wow. me the N word. The N word. You know? And so Mohammed wouldn't get sucked in to bring in all the other blacks so they could kill them in Vietnam and send them. Because blacks were very much dispor- disproportionately represented in Vietnam. Really? They didn't have oh, a lot of them? They, they, what was our black population then? Maybe 10, 11%? Was it even that high? And what percent were in Vietnam? Way more. Really? Sure. Because the people that serve like that are the poor people. Oh, yeah. Well, it's a lot of Latino. It's a lot of Mexican and black. It's a lot of poor white. Um, In my neighborhood in South Minneapolis, I grew up in South Minneapolis by the Lake Street Bridge, where what's-his-name died is my old neighborhood is all through there. Yeah. George Floyd. Yeah. Well, if you grew up there, you maybe had to go to work. 
Right. Well, then you went to Vietnam. I have all sorts of friends that got drafted. Yeah. But again, if you lived out at Lake Minnetonka or Edina, you didn't see Vietnam. You went to college. You got deferments. Yeah. See, it was so unfair. It's always been like that, unfair. though. It's always the poorest people are always the ones. And you know what they're going to have to do, do if the they work. bring it back? What? Going to have to draft women. Wow. They, they'll well, have I, to. Some of these bitches need to go no, out. No, they'll I have think. to. Yeah. How can they not? Now yeah. look, it's time. I want to see. I wanna no, have... I don't want to see no draft at all. I worked against the draft. I came back and used to used to march against really? the draft. Absolutely. Wow. Why, why should us? Why should the rich get out of it? Oh, I don't think the rich should get out of it. But I think you got to find a way to get everybody to be drafted and make it fair. That's why a lot of these things. It's like why, if it started happening they, to the rich people, things why would be do different. You need, if we weren't involved in all these wars, we wouldn't need all these people. Yeah. And besides, you kill people with pushing a button more than you do with boots oh, on yeah. the ground. These days, the actual people aren't having a chance in their own life, even almost, in their own safety no, out there. The, the whole war thing is, is sad because uh, we spend all our money in preparation for war. I mean, everyone's bitching about Biden's $3.5 trillion being too much. It's too much to spend that on us? They have no problem spending that in Afghanistan. Right. Had no problem spending it in Iraq. But yet here they're going to spend it on people in the United States and there's an outrage. Yeah. It's too much. Too much money for us. Yeah. It's our money, but it's too much for us. Oh, God, don't give it to us. Don't help out Americans. Yeah. Certainly we could ship it off to a war and build a nation somewhere. You know, we could yeah. spend trillions like we did in Afghanistan and Iraq. And what do we have to show for it? Zilch. Not a ton. You know, but oh God, no, don't, that's way big to price tag. Us Republicans aren't going to stand for that. That's a good point, man. You know, you're spending the money on us? Yeah. On people of America? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jobs programs and, 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 and you know, uh, uh, leave so women can work and think, you know, for kids and babies and all. Oh, God, we don't want to spend money on that when we can spend money on a new aircraft carrier. Yeah, that's crazy, huh? You know, Jesus, come on. It's uh, Yeah, that is. I a, hope everyone's getting my sarcasm. I hope a, no, I'm being over the top are. with it's it. It's a lot good. of a dirty funnel, good, man. Good, 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 Because you never know today. Somebody's yeah. going, oh, you should have heard what Jesse said. Well, <laughs> fuck them, man. People, look, I think you speak loud and clear, and I think it's obvious what you say. And uh, Jesse, you have quite a body of work, and I just appreciate you being here and spending Thanks. time today. There were they some things. Me you're a comedian. I am, man. I am. Uh, well, finish me with a freaking joke. Sometimes. <laughs> well, I'm going to put you on the hot spot. Give me a freaking joke, comedian. <laughs> uh, let me think of something good, I got man. One. All right. Let's, let's you. Let's. Happened at golf years ago. Okay. I was playing with the, and a guy from Wisconsin told it to me. Uh huh. Did you hear about when Jeffrey Dahmer had his mom over for dinner? You know who Jeffrey Dahmer oh, is? Oh, yeah, right? yeah. The dangerous man. Yeah, you heard about when he had his mom over for dinner? Uh uh. Yeah, well, his, he had his mom over for dinner, and his mom said, Jeffrey, you know, I just don't care for these friends of yours. And Jeffrey said, That's okay, mom, try the vegetables. <laughs> now, to, re 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 to remind you, Dahmer's the guy that was the cannibal. Oh, yeah, no, I know. <laughs> I almost ate a freaking Vietnamese guy one time at a damn Best Buy. <laughs> I thought so. I heard that joke playing golf. I thought it was kind of I mean, funny. No, look, I think it's good, man. You got to remember the cheeseheads over there. They birth a lot of the. You know about Ed Gein, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh dude. yeah, he's a cheesehead right across the he river. He was a Packers fan. Sure, he had. Well, I don't know if he was a Packers fan, but he's a cheesehead. Oh yeah, yeah, that's he a, was. That's somebody from Wisconsin. He's from Illinois. He was from You're Wisconsin. Talking, yes. Oh, I thought he's from Illinois. Hell no, he's wow. Wisconsin, but. 800 miles over the border over there. A lot of creeps out there, that man. Gain. Yeah. <laughs> That's where they did Psycho. Dude, you know, Lee, Lee Harvey him. Oswald went to school in my hometown. Did he? Yeah, in Louisiana. Pretty cool, man. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. You know who you would love to talk to, man, is Robert Kennedy uh, I've, Bob Jr. I've talked to him. You have? Yeah. He's a really smart guy, man. Both of you guys I've, just have so much information. I've, uh, I've taken his son diving. Wow, that's cool. His son oh, his sons are awesome. Aren't he, they good well, kids? No, his son w was down in Cabo. And uh, we have a mutual friend, Dick Russell, who I've done books with. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so uh, Robert's son wanted to go diving with an authentic frog band. Wow. So I went over there and joined him, and, and I took Robert's son diving. Yeah. So he could dive with an authentic real frog band. That's and cool, And he was pretty dude. excited over that. And it was, yeah. I, I enjoyed it. 
you know, g- g- kind of granting the kid's wish, you know? Yeah. You know, he will tell his friends, yeah, I've dove with a real frog, man. Yeah. You know, so. Uh, no, he's a, he's a special deepest guy. Deepest I've ever been, 212 feet. Damn. Under man. the water. What was down there? Nothing. Yeah. It's blacker than hell. Can't see a thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you can't yeah. see your hand in front of your face. Did you get scared or no? No. Yeah. There's a bounce dive where you go down. We did it off Point Loma. It's a great story. Uh, bounce dive, probably 10 or 12 pairs of guys. And what you do is you're going down 212 feet. You're staying there for a minimum time so you don't have to decompress. So okay. your bottom's about 30 seconds. Okay. Then you got to start coming up, but you come up only where's your slowest bubbles. Are you on a rope? Yeah. Okay. They, 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 the thing down, you get down there and you're, you'll see how deep you they, they dropped it down 212 feet. Dang. So we went down 212 feet, and the good part was off Point Loma, we all got done, about 10 swim pairs. We were pulling the rubber raft boat into the PL boat, and one of my teammates go, is on the fan tail, the back. He goes, hey, guys, check it out. And he points over here. Here come a freaking great white. Yeah. Swimming right on the surface, dorsal fin, about a foot and a half out of the water, cruised right by us, as big as jaws. And we're all sitting in the PL boat watching this big boy go by. We had detracted his attention. Oh, wow. Apparently us going up and down. The pairs, he came over to see what, what's this? Damn. And uh, we had just all happened to get out of the water when he went cruising by. See, I was happy that I was in the seals and was a frog man. Jaws didn't come out till 75. Oh. I was discharged yeah. and out of the Navy by then. <laughs> Because if they'd had Jaws, yeah. I'm sure they would have showed it to us one night in training. Yeah. We would have had to sat and watch Jaws and then go on a swim. Oh, that would have been spooky. No, that, I mean, the instructors would do that just to get guys to quit. Yeah. Okay, you just watched Jaws. Now we're going on a two-mile ocean swim. I'd have quit. <laughs> I'd have quit, man. The farthest uh, swim I had to do, five miles. Really? Yep. Straight or is it? No, uh, they just take you five miles from the beach in San Diego, and they dump you off. They're out there with a the PL. They got an M16. Damn. In case anything comes around. You know, there's always a guy with an M16. And they, you're, you're out so far with the, in the swells, you can't even see the skyscrapers of San Diego. Wow. At water level. And they just point and say that way. And you start swimming, and five miles takes you a good part of the day. Damn. You know, you spend, I was a good swimmer, so I got in early. It is enjoyable. Do you kick your legs when you swim, or you just sure use your you arms? Do. You got fins on. Damn right you uh, do. Oh, yeah. Cripe, you don't want to not use your fins. Yeah, I mess up some. You do it with fins. You got to qualify for them, though. You got to swim a swim under a certain time, then you get your fins. Oh, damn. And then from that point on, you can do all your swims with fins. And you, hell, you're in the ocean. You want fins. Oh, yeah. You're not in a pool. You know, I did my share of swimming on the line. Yeah. You know, competitive swimming. My claim to fame, I actually swam in the same pool with Mark Spitz once. Oh, damn. You know, didn't compete against him. I just was in the same pool. Could you have been a competitive swimmer, you think? Not, I was, just not at his level. Yeah. <laughs> He's the seven Olympic gold medals. Yeah. He, he was good. even, when Phelps broke his record, mm-hmm. <laughs> it was remarkable. I didn't think anyone ever would. But Spitz's record was still better than Phelps's eight. You know why? Spitz's seven is better than Phelps's eight, in my opinion. Because it was in more categories? Mm-mm. One reason. Um, Spitz's seven gold medals were also seven world records. Oh, wow. Phelps's eight gold medals were eight gold medals, but not every swim was a world record. Damn. Mark Spitz's seven golds were also seven world records. I take. I like that. You know, seven gold medals, seven world records. I can barely fucking swim. And, uh, oh, I could. I swam. I, oh. I spent more time in a pool than I did in on land I would ride on your back I bet I would probably ride on your back no I I, that's why I don't swim today yeah I don't even I have a place on the ocean I don't even go out in it damn there's what's out there you've seen it all you've been through it it all what do I want to go out there for you got a big body of work Jesse Ventura you got okay, a big well, body of work. You haven't given me a joke yet. I can't leave. I gave you a joke now. I, I, a lot I gave of, you the Dahmer I, joke. Come you're on, right. you're a comedian. Find me a freaking joke. All right, I got this joke then. This is one. Uh, what do you call a fish with no eyes? A fish with no eyes? Uh, what do you call a fish with no eyes? It's got to be so. Okay, what, what's in the water that's blind? I don't know what. A fish. 
A what? A fish. Yeah, my niece told me that one. Thank God it was your niece. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll give it a pass now because right. your niece told you that one. I wanted something from your comedy routine. Oh, here's not, one I got from not you. Not your little niece who comes up with a funny. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you this. Give her credit. Then. That's okay. How old was she? Uh, I think she's nine. Yeah, well, that's that. Uh, that fits about a nine. Yeah. That's a good <laughs> that's one. Good here. All, All right, right, I got one good. for you, for dude. The nine-year-old, very good. Okay, here's one. Give my, me one from your routine. Okay, my cousin just got busted for uh, pot. Sucking really small dicks. <laughs> That's just a joke. So, so either way you lose here. Today. I mean, <laughs> they're all bad ones. Where Jesse. are you playing? At? <laughs> they're all bad ones. So I know where I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse Ventura, you better get something to make me laugh. I'll How am I going to come good. see you? You with, know what? I got a special coming you, on. Now you do stand up. Yeah. You know, I've been told that I could do that. Really? Yeah, because I can hold. I can. Oh, I could see you holding a room. Yeah. I could see you doing tours like Jocko Willink does. He does a lot of speaking and tours. Well, and what I do, I don't really do stand-up comedy, but I do a lot of make people laugh yeah. while I, with the stupidity of things I tell them. I'd like to. I'd like, you know? Oh, I think the points you would make and bring in, insight into people, I think, would be see, a, a lot of people would be laughing at themselves. Because, like I said earlier, the thrill for me was being able to go to Harvard. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll tell you this, too. I, maybe they've been broken now, but I had the largest classes in Harvard history. Damn. <laughs> they had to move me into the commons because <laughs> my classes were open to everybody. And so, oh, yeah, they had to move me in the commons because it was the, the place would just fill up. Oh, do you? You're and, like, and, you, uh, you remind me of like Christopher Lloyd if he had big fucking balls, you know? Yeah, well, and it was fun. Uh, just it was fun for me to be able to go there and influence kids who I know are going to end up probably being important. Right. You know, because of where they go to school and, and, and everything like that. And uh, it's like uh, when Muhammad Ali went and spoke at a Harvard graduation. Wow. You know, and... I need to go back and listen to some of that stuff. And you know, Muhammad, when he spoke at the Harvard graduation, he set the world's record for the shortest poem. Damn. He did. What it was, you remember? Well, yeah. He, uh, he was speaking at the graduates of Harvard. I heard the to story told. And somebody in the crowd yelled out, give us a poem. And Ali looked at the crowd, and it was the shortest. The, the, it should be the shortest in history. He went, me, we. It's not this. All right. And that's the shortest poem in history. <laughs> me, we. Me, we. <laughs> And Ali did that off his top of his head. Oh, that's interesting. And the guy who talked about it was uh, Plimpton, I think it was. I heard George he was, Plimpton? Yeah. Oh, damn. He was talking, or it was either him or an, a, another one of them famous writers. And they said, they looked it up and they said, that that's would it. qualify as, because the, the one before had three syllables. Damn. Ali's had two. And then the one that was listed as the record had three syllables. He was a real master. You know. I was lucky I got to spend a day with him. Really? Oh, yeah. What'd y'all do? Did y'all go to dinner? No. Sat in his house in Barron Springs. I didn't want to go to no frickin' dinner. Yeah. I wanted to, I was in his house all day with just his people and me and my people. And uh, he, well, because the story is when I won the governor, um, I got up and I talked that night about that I was a young kid when Muhammad Ali, then Cassius Clay, beat Sonny Liston for the world title. I said, nobody believed that Cassius would win, now Ali. And I said, that night, he said, he shocked the world. Mm. Well, I said, tonight, we shocked the world. Gang. Don't end there. I'm in the governor-elect. I'm in the bowels of the Capitol. I haven't taken over yet. And a business friend of mine, Harvey McKay, shows up on my schedule for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And Harvey walks in. I said, Harvey, what are you doing here? He said, I brought you something. And he had a big box. Said, Better open it. I opened the box up. On the inside was a pair of Everlast boxing gloves. Oh, wow. I hate this part. Cause... What makes you sad? Well, he's my hero. Oh, yeah. The boxing gloves 
<clears throat> said to Governor Ventura, you shock the world, Muhammad Ali. He was watching uh. that night. Sorry. He was watching that night, and he took the time, and that's what set up for me to come visit him. Wow. And when I went to visit him, he was, of course, stricken with the Parkinson's, but his wife Lonnie said to me, she said, you know, Mohammed wouldn't take his medicine last night. And I said, why? She said, because it, it slows him down and he didn't want to be slow. He was so excited you were coming today. Uh. And I thought, Muhammad Ali is excited that I'm coming to see him? Give me a break. <laughs> you know? What, 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 what made you so happy that he was proud of you? Because he's my hero. Yeah. He's a, he's a guy who, if you read his biography, he developed his whole style from pro wrestling. Oh, wow. And uh, he uh, battled the system. He was a man who stood up for what he believed in and was willing to pay the price for it. And I don't think there's a better hero you can have in yeah. the world. And so he's my hero. He always was. He always will be. And I think it kind of shocked Mohammed because uh, uh, do you want to hear what I did for him that day? Yeah, I would like to hear that. And this will be the ending. I don't know if your tape's still running. We might be out of tape. That's okay. Here, here's what I, I, I looked at him and I said, I am the greatest by Cassius Clay. This is the legend of Cassius Clay, the most beautiful fighter in the world today. He talks a great deal and brags indeedy of a muscular punch that's incredibly speedy. The fistic world was dull and weary. With a champ like Liston, things had to be dreary. Then someone with color, someone with dash, brought fight fans a-running with cash. This brash young boxer is something to see, and the heavyweight championship is his destiny. This kid fights great. He's got speed and endurance. But if you sign to fight him, increase your insurance. <laughs> this kid's got a left. This kid's got a right. If he hits you once, you're asleep for the night. And as you lie on the floor while the ref counts ten, you pray that you won't have to fight me again. For I am the man this story's about. I'll be champ of the world, there isn't a doubt. Here I predict Mr. Liston's dismemberment. I'll hit him so hard, he'll wonder where October and November went. <laughs> Here I predict, and I know the score. I'll be champ of the world in 64. <sighs> now, that's off memory. Yeah. That's your hero. Tell me. He, would, he, he didn't. And when I did that for him, he had tears in his eyes because I think he thought, what the hell would a little white boy in South Minneapolis? And you know where that's from? He did an album way back called I Am The Greatest mm. disc, where he's standing there with his foot up and holding a fist. I Am The Greatest by Cassius Clay. I used to listen to that album day in and day out wow. as a young 10, 11-year-old kid who wanted to be a fighter and ended up a wrestler. Yeah. You ended up pretty close, though. Well, Mohammed learned from uh, Gordon Wrestling? George. Wrestling? No, it's interesting. Yeah. No, he said he went to an interview once, and it was him and Gorgeous George. And he sat and listened, and he was early in his career, and he heard Gorgeous George bragging away and doing what wrestlers yeah. do. Well, Muhammad said that night I was boxing in front of 20 people. He said Gorgeous George was wrestling in front of 5,000. Wow. Light went off. Muhammad said, you got to sell yourself here. You got to do what these wrestlers do. Start, and that's when he started naming the round. Yeah, they all must fall in the round I call. They all must lose in the round I choose. You know, and he started predicting his knockouts, and then he did it. Speaking and things into what, existence too. It's kind of wild. What, that's what really got him going. He then did it. Yeah, you know. But no, Ali, Ali was bigger than life, really, uh, for what he stood for, and you know, this kid from Louisville who rose up and learned and wouldn't be manipulated and uh and he 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 stood for what he believed and he wouldn't compromise and i'd like to believe that everything i do is very much in that aspect for me too and mm -hmm. then if whatever i do i'd make him proud you know and uh we ran into each other later out in la 
I saw Lonnie at the hotel in Beverly Hills. I looked over. I said, Lonnie, what are you doing here? I said, Jesse. Da-da. I said, is Muhammad here? She goes, oh, yeah, he's up. She told me the foot. She said, I can't. She said, go up. He'd love to see you. Wow. So I ran to the other. It's that hotel that's on both sides of the street. I ran to the other one, got in the elevator, went up there. She told me the door, rang the doorbell up there. And I'll never forget this young black kid opened the door. He saw it was me. And his jaw dropped and he was frozen. And I looked at the black kid and I thought, and he could, I thought, you're frozen looking at me and you're in a room with Muhammad Ali? Something wrong with this picture. <laughs> Are you kidding me? You no, know, this kid was all Jesse Ventura. You know? <laughs> so I came in and Muhammad and I hugged and talked and. Had a good little thing there, and he was the car was coming for him. He was doing something or other, and you know, and I was out there doing business or whatever. And, and yeah. then later, you know, of course, he died and all of that. But he'll live forever. Yeah, you know, I think is he'll live as long as I'm around because he's alive in the story. I mean, he lives through stories, lived through lore. My, even my dad, and my dad knew a lot about boxing. He fought a little himself and all that. The World War II vet. My dad gave in to me in the end. You know what he said. Mm. He said, that Clay kid, he said, he's the best ever. Wow. And I said, why is that, Dad? Why would you say that? My dad died in uh, 91. And I said, Dad, how come now you say that Muhammad's the best ever? He said, I'll tell you why. He said, speed. Mm. He said, no heavyweight has ever had the speed that guy had with his legs and his hands. He said he'd have beat them all. Mm. And my dad grew up with Dempsey. He grew up with all the greats. But he said, Ali to beat them all. He said, there was no way they could have contended with his speed. And he proved it. Well, he proves the opposite to George Foreman. Yeah. He got George with rope and hope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, he's remarkable to watch, man. You know, changed his whole style and got George to punch himself out. He's one of a kind. <laughs> and big George did. <laughs> and George ended up being a hell of a guy after that. George Foreman's, you know. He went into depression, I heard, for two years, but when he came out of it, George Foreman's one of the most likable guys in the world now. Amen. You know, and, and, and he, today he just says, I just thank goodness I fought Ali. Wow. You know? <laughs> he made me, took me to <laughs> elements I'd have never got to. <laughs> well, you're doing that for us, Jesse. We thank you so much thank for you. your time. Jesse the Body Ventura, thank you so much for being here today, man. Thank you. Yep, My man. pleasure. Have a good day.